Доброе утро, коллеги. Вижу, что все больше людей присоединяется. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, you probably uh, received the information uh, uh, note and you know that you have uh, the option uh, to choose the translation. Uh, you'll see uh, a small blob in the bottom and you uh, can choose your preferred language. Uh, Christina, right? it disappeared. The, the la this, it disappeared, <laughs> the translation. The interpretation function was uh, stopped. If you could uh, switch it on again, please. Okay, I do. Now it's available? Yes. La mini, no. Christina, the disk mini. Okay. Okay, so uh, good good morning. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, from my experience in Ukraine, uh, we have delay about 30, 40 minutes when we, uh, we organize this national dialogue. So because it's technically quite difficult to organize. That's why if it will, if it will happen today, so it would be not surprising because it's really quite difficult to organize interpretation in both language and also technically provide so huge meeting. Hello guys, sorry I'm late. Uh, I was looking for a link, uh, but uh, do we have a delay for the um, translation or? I must say I'm surprised that it uh, worked to organize it so quickly to send all the information to the people, to register people. Um, that was amazing, in fact. And uh, all the templates for the presentations. Thank you, Olena. Can you uh, try the interpretation button and uh, check, uh, do you want the English or the Russian? Uh, because I understand the, the, if you want the translation, it's going to be from English to Russian. If you don't need the uh, translation, uh, then you don't check, uh, you see the, the button interpretation, and then you won't hear the interpretation. Uh, so people who will choose Russian, they will, will uh, hear it. The interpretation works, that's what people say. Ah, so, okay, okay. Uh, yes, no, I, I uh, decided to, yesterday we were talking with Christina and I uh, decided to speak Russian because uh, she thought it's easier. Yes, and uh, Oksana supported that also. So, but which button should I press or not to press buttons? So, so uh, I have checked it recently and Russian translation uh, works sorry. perfect, but English variant uh, at the moment it's not necessary because we, we are talking English. Uh, no, uh, if, uh, I would like you to choose the channel uh, that you'll speak uh, because otherwise the, uh, the translation will be not very good and uh, when uh, the translator will speak, uh, uh, he will hear you as well. So if you right. speak... If you speak now, Russian, now, they, now this interpretation says off. Oh, if I want to speak Russian, what should I press? Which Russian. should I? Russian. Russian. Okay, I will speak Russian, so I press Russian. 
Yes. Uh, but now I hear all the uh, things that uh, I say in the Russian <laughs> translated. <laughs> Спасибо за перевод. <laughs> uh, you can mute the original audio in order to not hear you. Okay, then I say English. Uh -huh, okay, English means that I speak in English and then uh, don't hear English. Okay, uh, so I cool. think uh, we, we have uh, um, quite a good attendance as of now. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, I, I think we can, uh, we can start uh, the, uh, the interpretation uh, work. Uh, so uh, I will give the floor uh, to uh, Dr. Krudu and uh, Dr. Jose Dominguez for the uh, introduction, and uh, after that, we'll have the welcome uh, uh, speech from our uh, presenter. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, dear participants and uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, previously, we decided of uh, Jose, uh, but I will speak in Russian, and I will present uh, uh, Russian speaking. Uh, 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 speakers and uh, Jose will uh, speak, of course, in English and present uh, our uh, speaking English. Мы рады приветствовать вас на нашем симпозиуме. Думается, что наш симпозиум будет иметь большой успех или во всяком случае будет информация доносена до тех, которые значит записались на наш симпозиум и также что э, интерес был очень большой э, так как э, основная цель нашего симпозиума обсудить с общественным, общественным и гражданским обществом приоритеты исследования с точки зрения людей затронутых туберкулезом э, во время симпозиума мы обсудим новые методы диагностики также и новые методы лечения э, медицинские услуги по борьбе с туберкулезом стратегии вовлечения сообщества в исследования Симпозиум организован в рамках совместного сотрудничества проектов Innova for TB and TB Rep. Специально по приглашению и приглашены докладчики с Европейского ВОЗ. Ну, я думаю, что про проект Innova TB больше расскажет Хосе, так как он является координатором этого проекта. И... Поэтому я хочу попросить сказать пару слов о проекте. Потом значит, мы предоставим слово нашим, нашим э, э, гостям. Хосе? Yes, thank you, доктор Круду. Uh, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining the meeting. And yes, I give a brief uh, summary of our consortium. Uh, I will later explain probably a, a bit more during my presentation, but the Innova for TV is an international project that has been funded by uh, the European Commission. And it's a consortium, it's a project that is focusing innovation uh, for improving the management of the tuberculosis. Our idea is to uh, promote the exchange between uh, the staff of the different institutions. The consortium is constituted by universities and also uh, research institutes, hospitals, and also uh, companies. And we are focused, as I mentioned before, in developing technology and developing new strategies for, uh, for treatment. Um, uh, basically, this will be one of the the objective of our consortium. Obviously, we are extremely interested in being involved with the NGOs and the communities and other stakeholders to improve the, the, the fight against the TB, especially in uh, Eastern European and Central Asia countries. Uh, I think this is enough for presenting the NOAA for TV at the moment. Uh, but let, Valery, if you want to continue with the, okay. with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Uh, I think, well, okay. Я думаю, что сейчас уже нам надо предоставить слово нашим гостям. 
для приветствия. Okay, good morning and uh, welcome very much to this webinar. There are three reasons I think it's an important event happening today. First, we are living in a pandemic with coronavirus. And of course, the necessary resources must be allocated to fight this infectious killer. But in this period of time, it's always a risk that all diseases, all infectious killers are neglected and forgotten. It is important not to lose focus on the control of tuberculosis in this time. And I've seen signs from different countries in different parts of the world that the number of diagnosed TB cases is dropping quite rapidly now. Most likely not to the fact that there are fewer cases, but we have a delay in diagnosis and work. So keep up the fight against tuberculosis, and we will hear a bit more about how uh, corona and tuberculosis actually can be dealt with later in this webinar. My second thing is new tools. We do have new drugs, new drug treatment, new recommendations of treatment of, of MDR-TB, and we have in, uh, new diagnostic tools in the pipeline and being addressed. It's important to be aware of these possibilities and discuss how to best use them, how to best implement them, and to best coordinate them. So we don't have tools and drugs available that are not used and not implemented in the national TB controls. And my third point is collaboration. I think collaboration is a key factor to a successful TB control. And with collaboration, I mean various things. I mean how we in the TB control sector could work together with our colleagues in controlling HIV, hep hepatitis B, and so on. I think there are clear synergistic possibilities, both in the diagnostic and the controls. But this webinar focuses specifically on the collaboration between the national structures of TB control and the NGOs. And I, I'm convinced there is a big room for increased collaboration with various NGOs to, to offer important input and uh, assist a lot in uh, controlling TB in various countries. I think this is a resource that has not been fully uh, appreciated and fully evaluated. So having said that, I welcome you again to this webinar and look forward to spending a few hours together with you and hearing and discussing these topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. Fiona. Yes, uh, thank you, dear partners and colleagues near and far. I'm honored to uh, welcome you to this event on behalf of the PASS Center uh, and our civil society implementing partners. I represent uh, an organization which is a civil society organization based in Moldova. Uh, we have been working in the field of TB since mid 2000s at the national level and uh, bringing innovations both in program sense, such as expert technology rollout in the country, to, way, to the way TB services are delivered, financed, and building the role of TB, uh, TB civil society in the national TB response. In Moldova, uh, this has been a central piece of comprehensive people centered response uh, and uh, well ahead other countries in Eastern Europe and Central. Asia. Uh, we also lead a regional grant as a principal recipient uh, in which together with our civil society regional uh, partners uh, such as TB Europe Coalition, TB People and Global TB Caucus as well as uh, WHO Regional Office for Euro, uh, we focus on bringing people-centered models of care and innovations into the ECA region. Uh, since 2016, TBREP has provided crucial support to strengthening civil society and communities' role in uh, putting people and communities first in TB response. And in fact, uh, mid-term evaluations, both in 2017 and in 2020, have highlighted this crucial role of uh, uh, building the prominence of civil society in the region, also giving a voice and a seat at the table, at the policy table, and making a vibrant civil society um, presence in TB response, uh, both in national decision making, advocacy, community mobilization, community based monitoring, but also service delivery. Uh, from my 15 year perspective, never it has been a time for civil society better than now. As part of the global mobilization leading to UNHLM declaration in 2018, the countries have made unprecedented commitments towards TB response. Uh, progress gained speed, then COVID came and took us 10 years back. 
Uh, with COVID, we saw disruption, frail health systems making us feeling overwhelmed and limited in our collective agency to catch up and recover the lost ground in TB response. In this context, the role of civil society and communities is crucial now as ever. A landmark document was produced last year by the communities, uh, the Stop TB uh, delegations uh, that represent, represent affected communities, developing countries, NGOs, and developing countries, NGOs, with inputs from 150 community partners from over 60 countries, communities, and civil and, and uh, um, making the point that communities and civil society organizations are a strategic partner in the necessary paradigm shift and can leverage the recovery of TV response in so many ways. I will name a few areas uh, which came up as actions, uh, particularly reaching all people through TB detection, diagnosis, treatment, and care and prevention, making the TB response rights-based, equitable, stigma-free with communities at the center, accelerating the development and access to essential new tools to end TB, investing the funds necessary to end TB, committing, uh, committing to accountability, multi-sectoriality, and leadership on TB, and leveraging COVID-19 as a strategic opportunity to end TB. In all these areas, there are many examples of successful uh, presence and uh, programs that have, have had uh, communities and civil society at the centers. Uh, and um, uh, we have played a central role in mobilizing and implementing action in MDR-TB response uh, with the meaningful engagement of affected uh, communities and engaging in the national processes. The value pro proposition of investing in community-based services is even higher now during COVID times. First, because there's a technology revolution in TB uh, with, for example, artificial intelligence, chest X-ray that can make screen faster and uh, operated by lay providers. New drugs and digital tools allow people to, uh, with drug-resistant TB to be treated at home and virtually. And ECA region is very well positioned for such to access all these technology advancements. Then we also reimagining re the model of TB care. Uh, the ECA region is literally the first region in the world uh, where when we hear people-centered model of care, we know what it means for TB response. So uh, we have a more prominent role now uh, for society, civil society in TB. Once envious of the HIV activism, it is now the TB world that has the vibrancy in the region. People with TB and civil society have be become more valued even so in COVID times. Uh, so uh, we need to mobilize resources and intention and be proactive in creating value so that truly no one is left behind. And I challenge you uh, to meet in December 2030 to celebrate our win in the ending TB region, uh, TB in ECA region, including through people-centered, rights-based and uh, approaches and ensuring equity. Thank you for being all uh, today. Uh, I wish you an interesting time at the symposium, and I want to thank to take time to thank all our partners, and in-country partners, uh, the Institute of uh, Physiopneumology, but also the regional partners, TB Europe Coalition, TB People, Global TB Caucus, um, the WHO and STP team, and the new partners that are uh, co-organizers today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tema. Uh, now we invite Askar. For... Dear colleagues, thank you. Yeah. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the WHO Regional Office for Europe and uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to, uh, pr to represent the WHO Regional Office for Europe on this regional event. And it is my honor to be here today. So I would like to be brief and uh, like slightly move to the presentation, but before I would like to say that the central to the mandate of, of the WHO uh, Euro is a commitment of leaving no one behind. Uh, this is operationalized in the, our agenda for health for the next five years, the European program of work, the EPW. So leaving no one behind is uh, relies on a very strong health systems with primary health care at core and uh, central efforts to reach everyone living with tuberculosis with care uh, they need uh, is partnership. Partnership with non-governmental organizations, partnership with institutions, partnership with civil societies and affected communities. And we are fortunate to work 
in close collaboration with all member states and with all partners and that are uh, combining efforts to reduce the burden of tuberculosis in uh, our region, especially now during these difficult times uh, when we all are living and in, uh, in, uh, during the pandemic of COVID-19. So uh, efforts to leave no one behind are closely aligned uh, with our uh, project, with our partner project that in the partner organizations at Pass Center Moldova, uh, TB Rep. And through this project and uh, in collaboration with Pass Center, uh, there has been a shift in the mindset at both political and provider level to facilitate the re uh, reorganization of TB treatment and care. And it also provides a roadmap of improving the health financing mechanism and new approaches to planning health resources for health. So with this, I would like to uh, thank you um, and again for participation. And if I may uh, ask you for your permission to present my slides and... Uh, move forward with the presentation. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I am sharing uh, your slides now, but please make sure uh, you are on the Russian uh, channels. Uh, so, Kristina, you will be показывать slides or I will show them? Yes, I will show you English, you will be talking in Russian, but you will be able to show you on the Russian channel. То есть я показываю свои слайды, хорошо. А у меня показывает, что я не могу показывать свои слайды. Сейчас? Да, могу. Uh, уважаемые коллеги, uh, я буду говорить на русском языке, и разрешите мне осветить вопросы эпидемиологии туберкулеза в европейском регионе ВОЗ и рассказать о текущих операционных исследованиях, которые проводятся в нашем регионе. И сначала разрешите коснуться того, что региональный план по туберкулезу нашего региона на 2016-2020 год подошел к завершению в прошлом году. Мы опубликовали финальный отчет, который на сегодняшний день опубликован на сайте Европейского бюро ВОЗ. И в данном отчете описан прогресс по всем направлениям, по всем активностям, которые проводились в течение этих пяти лет, которые были направлены на достижение основных трех индикаторов, которые мы обязались и совместно с, помогали странам достичь к 2020 году. Если вы можете посмотреть, то по показателю заболеваемости туберкулеза снижение заболеваемости имело своей целью достичь 25%. Но в течение этих пяти лет мы практически были, приблизились к этому показателю, и снижение составило 19%. По количеству, по смертности от туберкулеза целью региональной к 2020 году было снижение на 35%. Регион, все страны нашего региона сообща достигли и темпов снижения в 31%, что в принципе является достаточным показателем. Отношение, относительно профилактического лечения туберкулеза, здесь показан наш вклад в глобальные показатели. Если нашей целью значит, являлось достичь 200 тысяч пациентов, охваченных профилактическим лечением в течение 2018-2022 года, то, к сожалению, только 21% получили лечение в течение 2018 и 2019 годов. То есть есть к чему стремиться. Значит, только 10 из 53 государств-членов подали сведения в UNAIDS посредством ГАМ о превентивном лечении туберкулеза среди лиц, живущих с ВИЧ. То есть это, скорее всего, проблема либо в сборе информации, или в отчетности. Охват детей младше 5 лет в некоторых странах все еще остается низким. Бытовые контакты в возрасте более 5 лет в странах за пределами Европейского Союза систематического лечения, к сожалению, не получают. Сведения о людях, подвергающихся риску в глобальной базе данных, не фигурируются. 
К сожалению, туберкулез все еще остается серьезной проблемой в нашем регионе. И по данным последнего глобального отчета и регионального ежегодного отчета, который мы совместно делаем с ECDC по мониторингу и эпидемиологическому надзору в Европе, по данным на 2019 год, 246 тысяч человек заболели туберкулезом, из них 5% это приходилось на, де, на детей, и 35% среди них были женщины. 70 тысяч человек это были, случаев это были случаи с множественной лекарственной устойчивостью. 30 тысяч случаев это пациенты с случаи с отчетанной инфекцией ВИЧ. То есть бремя туберкулеза, оно неравномерно распределено между нашими странами. Если вы можете посмотреть, то в основном бремя туберкулеза приходится на страны Восточной Европы и Центральной Азии, так называемый регион ВЕЦА, в который кумулирует 82% случаев. И также помимо стран региона ВЕЦА дополнительно еще в шести странах, то есть это 18 стран с высоким бременем туберкулеза, они несут на себя основную ношу, основное бремя туберкулеза в нашем регионе. Хотелось бы отметить, что на сегодняшний день не все случаи с туберкулезом у нас диагностируются повсеместно. То есть 30 тысяч из 246 случаев, они не были диагностированы или не были выявлены, но не зарегистр... или были выявлены, но не зарегистрированы. Если посмотреть на данный слайд, то, из, то 5%, как я уже говорил, или 9 тысяч практически случаев туберкулеза были зарегистрированы системами здравоохранения среди детей, из которых 2800 это, – это дети младше 5 лет. Чаще всего туберкулез он поражает людей молодого и продуктивного возраста. Большую часть, конечно же, заболевают люди от 25 до 64 лет. То есть они подвергаются наибольшему риску заражения, и это отражается очень сильно на экономическом благополучии значит, семей, домохозяйств и на национальной экономике. Туберкулез с множественной лекарственной устойчивостью – остается в нашем регионе очень серьезный And also in our region, there are still nine countries with high burden of MDR-TB. You can see them on slide, and they are all located in the EECA uh, region. This list does not include two countries that also experience a burden of MDR-TB, but which are on the, the, their way to reach the reduction target, Armenia and Georgia, uh, but still they're part of the ESA region. Unfortunately, success in the multidrug resistant TB uh, is not yet optimal, so it's suboptimal, and the uh, health outcomes For the patients who started, started treatment in 2017, uh, their outcomes were published in the last WHO report, and uh, that is 59% um, uh, of success among patients with RMDR-TB. And in our region, that is even uh, lower, that is 40%, which is um, a very serious indicator. If um, we, if talking about the HIV co-infection among TB patients, then the estimated percentage, the percentage of TB cases co-infected with HIV almost doubled over the last decade in our region. And the number of people suffering from a TB HIV co-infection have seven times higher risk of failing treatment and three times higher risk of losing their lives than people suffering from TB only.
without the HIV co-infection. If we look at the uh, TBHIV co-infection diagnosis and treatment cascade, then out of all the people um, um, registered with TB and HIV, only 62% have um, TB treatment out of 82% of people who know about their status, which is not an optimal indicator, and we really have to pay attention to this. So I would like to move smoothly to TB treatment. And uh, if you look at this slide, then um, unfortunately, currently, if our regional target was to cover 1.23 million people during 2018-2022, uh, then now we have progressed only uh, up to 36%. Only 36% were treated in 2018-2019. Uh, currently, WHO, through uh, their guidelines that were published last year and um, at the beginning of this year, uh, is providing um, recommendations on uh, the new and simpler TB treatment of MDR uh, TB, which is which has a very high burden in our region. So using these opportunities, we will be able to expand coverage and uh, include more patients and treat more uh, MDRTB patients. Unfortunately, we have been living in the era of um, COVID-19 pandemic and uh, how much it has affected uh, all the progress had made uh, within the last years. That is uh, really, those achievements are at risk. In um, the WHO conducted several surveys um, in the countries, the global survey concerned uh, three main questions and uh, all the other sub-questions were linked to the main three. So th these are the following questions. Have any changes been made to how TB treatment uh, services are delivered due to the COVID-19 pandemic? The second question, have TB patients been asked to self-isolate at home? And third, has there been any reallocation of resources from TB services to COVID-19 testing and treatment? So I will show you data, not the global data, but the data on our region. And if you uh, will have a look, you will see that one third of the countries reported reduction of outpatient TB facilities for drugs susceptible and PRTB. And uh, 28 reported reduction of inpatient TB facilities for drugs susceptible and DP. Uh, RRTB. Uh, six countries, so 24% reported reduction in both outpatient and inpatient TB facilities for susceptible and uh, RRTB. Out of uh, 53 um, countries, members of the WHO uh, European region, not all uh, provided answers to this question. So what were the solutions in the countries? 76% of them expanded the use of remote advice and uh, support. Uh, they also used various uh, digital uh, methods and technologies in order to increase patient uh, adherence to treatment. 72% uh, allowed uh, to have TB drugs uh, at home for more than one month of treatment, which uh, uh, hadn't been the case before the pandemic, but um, that was the compromise or the way out that the governments and the national TB programs found. Um, 
in the circumstances of the pandemic. 68% introduced home delivery service for TB trucks and 48% allowed household members to collect TB trucks to be taken at home. Uh, the third question, has there been any, uh, uh, the, the second question about uh, self-isolation at home, 48% uh, um, uh, responded uh, yes, and, uh, that, and about 50% didn't ask for self-isolation of TB patients. Um, Regarding a relocation of um, uh, resources from TB services uh, to COVID testing and treatment, 46% of response, the responders mentioned that resources, some of the resources from TB services were reallocated to respond to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And that could affect and is affecting the um, uh, TB control activities in the countries of our region. At the same time, uh, I would like to mention the WHO um, Regional Office for Europe called upon the countries to present data on three indicators related to TB diagnosis and detection, initiation of TB treatment, um, uh, with uh, susceptible and uh, drug resistant forms, and also data on uh, retention in care. This survey covered um, 20, the year of 2020, January through June, compared to the same period of the previous year. 29 member states of the WHO European region submitted monthly data. And if before the pandemic uh, of COVID-19 in our region, we had uh, the average decrease of over 5% of TB uh, incidents, then 20, and we were reaching the regional target. Then in 2020, uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, uh, that, uh, uh, indicator dropped by 48%. And the peak uh, month was May of last year when the most of the countries were experiencing the highest burden of the first wave of COVID-19. And we um, think that this drop uh, accounted for those restrictions that were implemented for movement of patients within the uh, countries in order to make sure the COVID-19 uh, infection spread is stopped. If we look at the patients who uh, enrolled on uh, TB treatment, and I will uh, mention only RRMDRTB treatment patients. I'm sorry, we do not have, see slides changing. Could you please check your presentation? Я сейчас нахожусь на этом слайде. Не передвигаются? Все, сейчас уже передвигается. Спасибо. Извините, да. 14, то есть из стран европейского региона ВОЗ с высоким временем туберкулеза. 14 государств предоставили информацию по количеству пациентов, которые начали лечение по поводу множественной лекарственной устойчивости. И вы можете посмотреть, что в период с января по июнь 2020 года по сравнению с аналогичным периодом 2019 года снижение пациентов с амолутуберкулезом, которые начали лечение, достигло своего пика в мае месяце и в среднем показатель составил минус 45%. Это является грозным. Меньшее количество пациентов выявили за данный период и, соответственно, меньшее количество пациентов начали, начало терапию. Но говорит ли это о том, о том, что мы на самом деле, эти пациенты у нас значит, не присутствуют в популяции? Нет, они присутствуют в популяции. Просто различные меры, которые были предприняты странами, мы можем это предполагать, они повлияли на то, что доступ к диагностике туберкулеза и, туберкулеза и доступ к началу терапии был очень сильно на него очень сильно повлиял. Соответственно, 
Хотелось бы отметить, что в прошлом году Всемирная организация здравоохранения и партнерства «Остановить туберкулез» они сделали и опубликовали отчеты по моделированию значит, туберкулеза, который может нас ожидать в мире в ближайшее время. И в соответствии с моделированием ВОЗ, которое было сделано в прошлом году, если снижение регистрации случаев туберкулеза будет наблюдаться на 25% в течение трех месяцев, то это может привести к 13% увеличению смертности от туберкулеза. И на 50% соответственно на 26% увеличение смертности. Мы, к сожалению, наблюдали это в течение прошлого года, в течение первого полугодия. Анализ в течение второго полугодия Полугодия с июля по декабрь детально не проводился, но на сегодняшний день мы проводим сбор данных со всех стран-членов для того, чтобы посмотреть полностью влияние пандемии в течение 2020 года и как это и в течение 2021 года мы будем собирать это совместно уже в качестве глобального кола, который организован самой Всемирной организацией здравоохранения. Поэтому это является очень важным, очень важным и очень серьезным и грозным месседжем для всех нас, то, что пандемия COVID-19 может привести к серьезным последствиям. Большее количество смертей мы можем наблюдать, и, соответственно, сложные и более запущенные случаи туберкулеза мы также можем наблюдать, что может приводить очень часто к неблагоприятным исходам в лечении. Как пример я бы хотел привести пример из Казахстана, когда ежемесячное снижение количества регистрации случаев туберкулеза наблюдалось вот в течение первого полугодия. Если вы можете посмотреть, то в 2020 году наибольшее снижение наблюдалось в мае месяце, и оно, конечно же, связано, мы проводили такую аналогию, с такими ограничениями по передвижению и по передвижению пациентов. То есть Казахстан в течение 20, в мае месяца были введены более серьезные ограничения по передвижению и, соответственно, снижение значит, пациентов, которые регистрировались, регистрации случаев туберкулеза, оно наблюдалось в соответствующий период времени. Более детальную информацию мы планируем предоставить странам в виде публикации в ближайшее время. Значит, также хотелось бы отметить, что на сегодняшний день, и еще раз повторить, что Всемирная организация здравоохранения продолжает собирать данные, вернее, начала сбор данных по регистрации случаев туберкулеза и включения в программу лечения в течение за период 2020 года. И большое спасибо всем государствам-членам Европейского региона ВОЗ за предоставление данной информации. То есть в ближайшее время, я думаю, что мы сможем получить эту информацию в полном, в полном отчете и несколько позже, в 2020 году, данная информация будет доступна, насколько пандемия COVID-19 повлияла значит оказала влияние на страны нашего региона. И Всемирная организация здравоохранения в прошлом году опубликовала информационный бюллетень, в котором призвала страны продолжить оказание противотуберкулезной помощи, несмотря на пандемию COVID-19. И шаги, которые необходимы по обеспечению преемственности оказания противотуберкулезных услуг, они перечислены здесь, они касаются вопросов профилактики туберкулеза, диагностики, лечения и ухода, паллиативного, активного планирования закупки и обеспечения непрерывного, непрерывных поставок противотуберкулезных препаратов и адресования рисков. В отношении лечения хотелось бы сказать что и повторить, что лечение, предпочтение в лечении должно отводиться амбулаторным моделям. Оказание лечения с учетом пациент ориентированных потребностей пациента, а не стационарному лечению. Применять цифровые технологии для значит, поддержания пациентов и путем увеличения коммуникации, консультирования, оказания помощи и управления информацией и с участием значит, различных ведомств. То есть это наше общее усилие, которое мы должны применять и обеспечивать для того, чтобы значит, оказать и обеспечить непрерывность оказания противотуберкулезной помощи. Какие же шаги предпринимаются в нашем регионе? Значит, в нашем регионе, насколько вам известно, и многие страны являются членами этой региональной инициативы, 
начато операционное исследование региональное, которое включает в себя 14 стран и региона Восточной Европы и Центральной Азии, а также некоторых стран Европейского Союза, которые эта инициатива направлена на внедрение модифицированных, коротких, безинъекционных режимов лечения для множественной лекарственной устойчивости. Она начата в 2020 году и предусматривает собой применение безинъекционных режимов лечения, коротких, которые несколько отличаются от того, что на сегодняшний день рекомендуется Всемирной организации здравоохранения, ввиду того, что эти схемы лечения они более подходят по профилю лекарственной резистентности для пациентов региона ВЕЦА. Эта инициатива предусматривает собой несколько целей. Во-первых, первое – это улучшить результаты лечения больных с туберкулезом с ночной лекарственной устойчивостью, усилить надлежащую клиническую практику, усилить потенциал медицинских работников в исследовательской сфере и также сформировать консолидированно и генерировать качественный объем информации, объем данных для предоставления во Всемирную организацию здравоохранения для формирования будущих рекомендаций по лечению лекарственно устойчивого туберкулеза. Оскар, Эти схемы а, лечения... Да, sorry, я заканчиваю уже. Значит, схемы, они представлены на данном слайде, они, значит, используют, они полностью безинъекционные. Значит, две схемы для взрослых, одна схема для детей – и они используют те препараты, которые на сегодняшний день рекомендованы в Всемирной организации здравоохранения для лечения э, длительными режимами МЛУ туберкулеза. Но они настолько эффективны, настолько безопасны, э, что они могут э, способствовать э, сокращению продолжительности лечения. На сегодняшний день прогресс э, таков, что э, 820 пациентов э, по, по, в 12 странах уже начали лечение. Как вы можете увидеть, три страны – это страны Европейского Союза, Латвия, Литва и Румыния. Значит, и на сегодняшний день вот прогресс такой, что лечение осуществляется в течение 39 недель или 9 месяцев в региональную когорту. Мы работаем со всеми странами для того, чтобы страны продолжали лечение в рамках страновых когорт и включали пациентов для, на протяжении ближайших лет. Все это поможет нам повысить, повысить результаты лечения и сформировать хорошую базу доказательных данных для формирования будущих рекомендаций. В рамках этой инициативы мы также совместно с проектом Тибереп создали виртуальный медицинский консилиум, который помогает странам в обсуждении и ответов по получению экспертной оценки на сложные клинические случаи и также повышение потенциала путем проведения вебинаров по тем или иным интересным клиническим направлениям. Я бы хотел поощрить клиницистов и те проекты, которые занимаются лечением, обращаться в этот виртуальный медицинский консилиум за предоставлением экспертной помощи. И также хотелось бы сказать в завершении о том, что на самом деле внедрение модифицированных режимов лечения, пусть даже в рамках операционного исследования на сегодняшний день, значительно позволяет снизить количество таблеток, которые больной с ночной лекарственной устойчивостью получал, по сравнению с тем, что было рекомендовано ВОЗ ранее. То есть практически в шесть раз. Полностью отказаться от инъекции, сделать лечение более удобным, с возможностью лечения пациентов на амбулаторном этапе и повысить тем самым результаты терапии. И также добавить различные цифровые, методы цифровых технологий, которые, в качестве, которые мы называем видеосопровождение или видеосопорт treatment. Для нас это не только наблюдение за лечением, но и поддержка. И на данном слайде представлено значит, руководство по видеосопровождению, которое доступно на русском и на английском языке на сайте Евровоз, который вы можете ознакомиться. И мы со стороны Европейского региона ВОЗ поддерживаем страны в расширении доступа к этим технологиям. Хотелось бы отметить, что и представить вот пример Молдовы по лечению пациентов с модифицированными короткими режимами лечения, выразить огромную благодарность национальной туберкулезной программе. И э, это первые пациенты, которые начали лечение в сентябре 2020 года, и мы надеемся, что данная инициатива найдет свое продолжение. Здесь представлен Казахстан, это первые пациенты, которые начали лечение в, 2020, в октябре 2020 года. И в завершение я бы хотел отметить, что на самом деле, несмотря на пандемию COVID-19, мы все находимся вместе, 
для того, чтобы сохранить оказание противотуберкулезной помощи пациентам с туберкулезом, несмотря на пандемию. И все вместе мы сможем достичь целей устойчивого развития и целей глобальной стратегии NTTV. Спасибо большое. Извините, за, если я задержал. Большое спасибо, Оскар, за очень интересную информацию. Следующий спикер будет презентирован Хосе. Хосе, пожалуйста, презент next. Yes, I was talking, but it was my my microphone mute. I'm sorry. Yes, I I I'm telling that thank you, Ascar, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. And and now the next speaker is yes, Cristina Pratt, and she is going to talk about the COVID and turn challenges into opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, then the floor is yours, Cristina. Thank you very much. Okay, are you seeing my, my screen properly? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this nice uh, invitation. Uh, I will try to go through the impact of the COVID-19 on tuberculosis, but how to try to turn the challenges into opportunities, which is uh, something not, uh, not really easy, but uh, I think it's uh, mandatory that we try to after this uh, devastating uh, pandemic. So I will start by the bad news, uh, but uh, it has been uh, uh, very well explained by the, the previous uh, speaker. And as you know, uh, this was from the World Tuberculosis Day 2020, that is in April, and then the pandemic was just starting just on the first wave. And then it was still that we were saying that tuberculosis is the top infectious killer in the world that more people reach it uh, with uh, quality tuberculosis care, but still 10 million people felt ill with TB and that drug resistant tuberculosis remains a, a public uh, threat. And uh, we have seen uh, lately this uh, kind of news in the press uh, for different reports that the COVID pandemic may have uh, set up the fight against tuberculosis uh, between five and 12 years behind, and this is really bad uh, news. And uh, this is uh, reassured by the report that was just uh, presented, and it's expected that because of the disruption of services, there was an under-reporting, and we will face uh, an increased number of diseases when we are able to really count. But then uh, I would like to go, I chose uh, 10 opportunities to take into consideration. And uh, this is a slide from myself of three years ago, and it's not, uh, I'm not a visionary, but we all have uh, eyes, and we know that in the world uh, there is an aging and there is an increase in comorbidities because of that, that there are changes in the migration routes, that the non-communicable diseases are having an an impact uh, also in TB and the different treatments, uh, both the treatment of HIV and other immunosuppressive uh, treatments. But we were already talking about the emerging pathogens, including the antimicrobial resistance, and we are now with an emerging pathogens. And simultaneously, we had advances in diagnostic methods, in radiology, in uh, the big data management, and also the eruption of the social media, also in the scientific world. So uh, the first opportunity I will mention is the social awareness that uh, the transmissible infectious diseases exist, because believe it or not, there are some uh, settings where people was thinking that this was a kind of a forgotten thing. And of course, the respiratory diseases self. And uh, well, this is uh, the uh, Time uh, magazine talking about tuberculosis uh, years ago, and this uh, looked like a stigma uh, image. Uh, 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 год назад, и здесь мы достаточно хорошо видим элементы стигмы. Здесь на, этом, на этой фотографии мы видим, что все люди в масках. Конечно же, это драматично, но тем не менее, это возможность того, что мы можем знать о том, что это все же происходит, и, наверное, мы пересмотрим свои отношения с стигматизацией. 
также очень важно клиническое подозрение, и все должны, все должны знать о симптомах, о путях передачи, это наша работа, настаивать на том, что другие контагиозные заболевания тоже существуют, и COVID не что иное, как одна из них. И может быть, это ковидная инфекция и поможет нам больше внимания обращаться и быть на страже. Вторая возможность – это то, что необходимо уделять огромное значение быстрой и правильной диагностике, диагностическому тестированию. То есть тесты надо проводить как можно раньше и что касается туберкулеза, для того, чтобы предотвратить передачу и прогрессирование туберкулеза, необходимо применять хорошие диагностические тесты и также адекватное лечение. Я хотел бы также процитировать Вильяма Ослера, который говорит, что существует три раздела медицины. Диагностика, диагностика, еще раз диагностика. Я бы хотел, чтобы больше и больше людей знали об этом. Сейчас у нас беспрецедентное развитие диагностических тестов, потому что многие учреждения, научные институты делают все возможное, чтобы развивать эту отрасль. И это позволяет нам улучшить диагностику. Кроме того, третья возможность – это нужно очень хорошо разбираться в расследовании контактов. Для этого необходимо знать, как распространяется туберкулез. И мы очень хорошо знаем, как расследовать контакты в концентрических кругах. Мы начинаем от близких контактов и к более отдаленным контактам. Дальше необходимы знания в области эпидемиологии, чтобы знать полную ситуацию. Сейчас с COVID у нас уже есть более хорошие методы расследования контактов. И нам нужно воспользоваться этой возможностью и применять эти методологии и в случае туберкулеза. Четвертая возможность – это помощь со стороны технологического прогресса. Также хотелось бы отметить и важность биобанкинга для того, чтобы следить за различными видами штаммов. Также необходимо принимать во внимание перспективу человека, который является хозяином инфекции и самого патогена. И для этого мы сейчас все должны быть в курсе того, что существует геномика патогена. Мы знаем, что существует бразильский штамм, южноафриканский штамм. Мы знаем, что это все возможно. Конечно же, это можно спроецировать и на туберкулез. Мы знаем, что те, которые сотрудничают в консорциями, они знают, что существуют различные штаммы туберкулеза на различных уровнях. И это отличная возможность узнать именно ту ситуацию, в которых развиваются те или иные штаммы. В этом COVID является даже помощником. Дальше геномика человека или геномика хозяина. Сейчас она уже достаточно хорошо изучена в ситуации COVID и мы должны применять ее и при туберкулезе, чтобы получить новые цели лечения. И, и другая возможность, вы все об этом знаете, что клинические исследования очень необходимы. И в 
в эпидемии мы должны были обучаться, делая что-то. И в любом случае, даже если мы учимся на практике, мы должны обеспечивать безопасность и надлежащую клиническую практику. Все исследования должны быть хорошо обоснованы. То есть необходимо учитывать все фазы клинических исследований. И необходимо координировать все исследования на глобальном уровне для того, чтобы они были более легкими с точки зрения административных, регуляторных и логистических аспектов. И, конечно же, все это надо применять и в отношении туберкулеза. Шестая возможность... Я хотела бы отметить хэштег, что вакцины работают. Сейчас разработка вакцин достигла невероятно высокого уровня по отношению к различным производствам. Но, тем не менее, мы для туберкулеза еще используем ту же вакцину, которая уже сто лет. И... Тем не менее, очень много людей каждый год вакцинируют, и эта вакцина БЦЖ обеспечивает достаточно хорошую защиту против диссеминированных форм заболеваний. И, конечно же, она также является благотворной во многих аспектах. Эта вакцина прошла более 20 клинических испытаний. Эту вакцину испытывали и в отношении ковида. Но, конечно же, мы используем эту вакцину только в клинических испытаниях. И будет очень хорошей возможностью и в отношении туберкулеза хорошо понять, какие специфические и неспецифические эффекты имеет вакцина БЦЖ. Мы, тем не менее, должны разрабатывать и другие вакцины против туберкулеза. Вот портфолио вакцин против туберкулеза на разных фазах исследований. Конечно же, может быть... Еще необходима поддержка, особенно на экономическом уровне, для того, чтобы охватить общество в течение короткого времени. И, конечно же, мы понимаем, что это надо делать как можно скорее. Существуют различные механизмы действия, технологии, которые сейчас применяются в COVID, они могут быть в некоторой степени быть применены и для туберкулеза. И другая возможность – это то, что все мы живем в глобальном мире, но контекст все равно имеет значение, потому что очень важно знать, какова система здравоохранения, какие существуют ресурсы для клинических исследований, каково географическое положение, какие проблемы существуют в социальном и культурном плане, какова заболеваемость туберкулеза. То есть, когда мы применяем этот глобальный подход, мы должны очень хорошо разбираться в ситуации. Мы живем в мире, где... Люди привыкли путешествовать. Сейчас, конечно, это не всегда возможно. Но, тем не менее, есть, существуют некоторые страны, которые лишь некоторое время назад обнаружили всплеск туберкулеза. Но, тем не менее, появляются новые группы риски. И даже в моей стране более возрастная группа населения уже переходит в группу риска. Поэтому... Клиническое подозрение имеет важное значение. Мы должны принимать во внимание все эти контексты. Я хотела бы еще отметить единую перспективу в области здравоохранения. Это подход к человеку, к животному и к окружающей среде. Конечно же, во многом это касается противомикробной устойчивости во всех сферах экологии, 
это влияет. And because of the pandemic, I will say that we are much more aware of this impact, and that uh, needs also many considerations. Uh, of course, uh, we already know from years that there are long-term effects of tuberculosis and that we need a social science approach and a gender equality. And uh, this is not the same in every place. No? In the map of Europe, there is uh, uh, some uh, long-term functional disability. And in other places, there is patients with fibrocavitary disease where it appears the non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So well, now with uh, COVID, we are also seeing long-term respiratory complications of the patients that had a, a, a severe uh, pulmonary damage. And uh, there are many guidelines being developed. Let's also take uh, this opportunity because this kind of lesions can be quite similar than the ones uh, from tuberculosis. And of course, the social science approach, I, I mentioned here a project that I'm involved with also, that, uh, that has been taken very much into account uh, for COVID. And there is many work like uh, from your organizations uh, on that sense. And uh, the same for the gender equality, that uh, the real impact of the COVID pandemic at the gender dimension, but this is already well known for tuberculosis that is uh, also happening. And finally, now we have uh, many communication channels. No? Now we have the chance to be here more than 100 people in different places of, of Europe, but we have to use them uh, with a critical spirit, these communication channels. And uh, never before was so easy to communicate as now, but it was also never before so easy to miscommunicate. And well, it is defined by the WHO, the infodemic, as uh, too much uh, information, including false or misleading information in digital and physical environments during a disease outbreak. And this causes confusion and risk-taking behaviors that can uh, harm health. And it also leads to mistrust in health authorities and undermines the public health response. Uh, here in the WHO page, there is uh, ways to, find, uh, to fight against the infodemics. But uh, I will say that from our perspective as a scientist or healthcare workers, we also needed to adapt and to learn many things because of course it's a new disease that we had the knowledge of uh, similar diseases and similar uh, ways, uh, but we had to be connected uh, on daily basis and uh, to do all these virtual uh, congresses and so to, to really uh, be aware of, of what needed to be done. But we also have a responsibility at the academic level because there is now a social awareness of the importance of research, I think is that. But uh, we have to prevent infodemics and to prevent the non-constructive competition between us and to always communicate honestly, uh, to not make uh, super headlines of this is new a drug for the... Uh, so we still have many limitations in all the technologies that we are uh, developing and applying. And uh, I like this editorial that's saying, scientists keep an open line of communication with the public. And I think this is what we are trying to do today uh, here. And finally, uh, my last slide, uh, the clock is ticking was the slogan of this year, and it's time to end tuberculosis. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, Christina, thank you very much. Very nice, very exciting presentation. Congratulations. Uh, if someone has a specific question for Christina, maybe now is the moment, or maybe you can write in the chat and she will, uh, uh, she, in the questions, and maybe you could answer later, Christina. And well, we are, we have accumulated a bit of delay, then uh, I will, we will continue with the presentation. Now is my turn. I'm going to, to share my screen also to, to discuss and present uh, um, uh, my presentation, of course. Let me see. Mm -hmm. Okay, I assume that you are sharing my presentation now, my slides. Let me see. We see, no. we see your presentation. Okay. Wait a second. Wait a second.
Okay. Okay, you can see the presentation, I understand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, let's go then. Uh, uh, again, uh, thanks to everybody for joining today with this interesting symposium. Uh, my my uh, topic is the presenting the pipeline of new methods for TB diagnosis. Uh, well, I am Jose Dominguez. I am senior researcher in the Institute de Investigació Germán Stias y Puyol in Badalona, in Barcelona, Spain. You can see in the picture where is the campus is uh, with very nice views of Barcelona uh, between the Mediterranean Sea and the mountains, a very nice place for walking. I am also assistant professor in the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. And I am acting as a Innova for TV, uh, as a coordinator of the Innova for TV consortium. Then um, this is the, the, the different topics that I will discuss during my presentation. I will present briefly the Innova for TV to introduce the Innova for TV consortium, who we are. Then I try to convince you why we need new methods. Then I will present what is coming, which is the novelty in diagnostics. And I will summarize with our final conclusions. And then I hope we will have, we will have time for questions at the end of the, of the morning session before the break. Then the, the consortium, the Innova for TV consortium, it's an international project that is what's granted by um, the European Commission. And it's constituted by 16 institutions from uh, six different countries, uh, Moldova, Ukraine, Germany, uh, Sweden, Spain, and also Chile from South and Latin Caribbean countries. And, and as I mentioned before also, the project, uh, the, the, the partners are from universities, research institutions, uh, hospitals, and also um, uh, companies. Then the, the objectives of the, the objectives of the, of the project uh, are to study the host pathogen interaction, but also to develop a new methods, new diagnostic and multi-drug resistant test for detecting TB and resistant. And we are also improving the treatment therapy as an objective. However, we are extremely uh, happy and we're very proud with our training program. We are offering to early stage researchers, but also experienced researchers, the opportunity to perform visits, to perform secondments between one month and one year in another institution from another country and from another sector. And we offer international mentorship and international supervision during the, this period with the idea to improve uh, scientific and transversal skills and increase also the employability of the, of the partners, of the, of the participants. Then uh, let, me, let, me show, let me show you the, um, oops, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I assume that you can see again the slides. Yeah. Yeah, but two screen. Okay. Okay. Don't worry. I will continue. Mm -hmm. Then talking about the TV, you know that um, um, uh, eventually the tuberculosis has been presented as a duality between the latent and the clinical, the clinical, the active TB. But nowadays we know that the, that the, the tuberculosis uh, is, a, is a spectrum that uh, where in the latency we can see different stages with different risks of progressing to active TB. And also we can see that between the latent and the active TB, there are different stages like incipient TB or subclinical TB where patients have no symptoms, but they could transmit the disease. Then at this moment, we need to, to have technology methods for detecting or diagnosing the patients in the different stages to uh, offer the correct treatment and avoid to progress to active TB or to broke the transmission and to improve the, the, 
the, the, the probability to, to, to be cured and to avoid the, 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 the deleterious effect of the multidrug resistance even. Then the current TV diagnostic methods that we have uh, have um, advantage, but have also limitations. As you know, for the latent TV, we use the tuberculin skin test of the eyebrows. Both methods uh, have some advantage, but also limitations. The tuberculin skin test, for instance, uh, has low specificity in, uh, in, vaccine, in BCG vaccinated individuals because there is a cross reaction. And the eyebrows requires a laboratory, although they use a specific antigens that improve the specificity. But both tests are unable to identify who is increased to progress to active TB. And re re regarding the methods for active TB, the smear examination has low uh, sensitivity, the culture are slow, and the molecular methods, the LPA methods or others require a specific laboratories with uh, a specific trained staff. Although some of them, like GenExpert, is a good alternative because it's a automatic method, very simplified, that um, well, everybody compared with a coffee machine because it's very easy to, to use, but it's not available in all, in all the laboratories. In many countries, the, these kind of methods are only available in reference labs or district labs, but not in, in, in some kind of health uh, centers that are far from the center and are um, close to the patients. Then uh, there is a, a rich pipeline of, of TB diagnostics that are coming. And I'm going to introduce some of them to see uh, the, the accuracy and the performance of them. Focusing latent TB infection, mentioned that some new skin tests are, uh, are coming and others are, are, are uh, available. This is the case of the, the, the D skin test or others like the Serum Institute uh, tuberculin or the uh, Anui CFA uh, TST that are based in specific antigens that reduce the cross reactivity with BCG and other mycobacteria, non tuberculosis, non mycobacteria. And it could be a good alternative, although it uh, has the drawbacks of the in vivo methods. Regarding the IGRAS, mentioned that some of them, the version of Quantiferon that probably you know now, are progressing to a point of care test with a individualized um, cartridge for, um, for decentralized uh, study of the latency. But all the technologies are also available uh, in version early spot that could be automatized and it could also explore other cytokines for a more comprehensive study of the latency. Regarding progression to TV or to identify who has an incipient or subclinical TV, well, I want to, to mention this, this recent uh, article published in Nature Medicine, where we were, uh, where we, where we, we participate, uh, where it was uh, develop a personalized risk predictor. This is linked with the idea that probably mm, it's important to analyze individually the individuals because not all of us are, are the same. And in this score, using epidemiological and clinical data and also laboratory data, it is it's possible to identify individuals with higher risk to progress. But from a laboratory point of view, other technology are coming also for identified people with uh, high risk to progress or this incipient of subclinical TB is methods based on transcriptomics. People, um, technology, sorry, that is, exploring the genes that we are expressing. Normally, genes re related with the inflammation. And it has been seen that it's possible to identify who is going to progress if uh, according with the profile of the genes that they are expressing at that moment. And even it's possible to see if the patient is improving with the treatment using this transcriptomic profile. This is one example, this application of this very nice study published from the group of South uh, Africa, where they were able to uh, see a specific transcriptomic profile of genes that with six months in advance are able to predict who is going to progress to active TB. Then they show how the profile change from a healthy control uh, are changing until the moment of the development. 
of the RTTP that is clearly different. But also, they also demonstrate that how profile is changing again and from disease to healthy when the treatment is uh, instaurated and they uh, follow the, the drugs. And talking about the active TV, um, I want to, to discuss a bit the digital X-ray that is new technology that is coming. It's not microbiological test, but it's a, a diagnostic test. Uh, a big effort it has, it is done in developing portable X-ray and using artificial intelligence for analyzing the, the X-ray in a in, by software with the idea to perform active case finding. And I think this could be a good opportunity for some settings and some vulnerable po population for increasing the, the TB diagnosis. Coming back to the laboratory, a uh, new um, point of care molecular diagnostic methods are coming. Some of them in the same format of the um, uh, GenExpert new versions, the ultra, the edge of the omni, more portable and with higher sensitivity. And also all the technology from Moldio is an Indian company that has a portable equipment with batteries for uh, autonomy that are able also to identify very quickly and very easy the presence of the bacteria and at least the resistance to rifampicin. Other technology uh, in, a, in a big size for reference laboratory has been developed and some of them are available and other are coming for detecting a large, uh, for, for analyzing a large number of samples simultaneously. And also new platforms using new cartridge for detecting resistance for the first line and the second line are also in the pipeline. And finally, the last method that I want to introduce you is the the test base in, in, in detecting antigen in a specific antigen of tuberculosis in urine. This is a quite potential, uh, very useful method because it's using uh, non-invasive sample, it's not based in sputum. That is good because some patients, even children or HIV patients are not producing a good quality sputum. And in a few minutes from the urine, we are able to have a, a result. And in our hands, uh, in adults and in children, the test uh, has a good performance with a sensitivity in, adu in, in adults about the 70% with a high specificity and that promising, re promising results in, in, in children also. Then the conclusions uh, of the presentation uh, will be that promising methods, biomarkers and signatures are coming to allow accurate diagnosis and prognosis. And I think this is very important and it's linking with the Christina presentation. It's critical to validate in different geographic settings and to translate to test to a near patient platform. But also, from my view, also it's important to maintain good communication between all the professionals uh, involved in TV, but also communities, patients and other associations, because we are, we are a team and we have to work together. And this is my last slide. This is our um, account in the different uh, social networks, our emails and our um, websites, just in case you want to um, check our activity or you want to contact in the future for, for discussing or for collaborating. Uh, thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Jose. Um, Окей, я должен нажать что-то на другое. Я хочу представить следующего нашего спикера и перейдем от диагностики к лечению туберкулеза, так как в последние 10-15 лет появилось очень много информации об этом лечении туберкулеза, особенно резистентного туберкулеза. Появились новые лекарства новые схемы лечения. И наш следующий докладчик Андрей Дутник, доктор медицинских наук, врач-пульмонолог, занимает должность доцента кафедры туберкулеза, клинической иммунологии и аллергологии Национального медицинского университета имени Пирогова в городе Виннице Украины. Также Андрей является национальным экспертом по клиническому мониторингу и оперативных вмешательств под руководством ВОЗа. 
и принимает участие в исследовании модифицированных стандартизированных коротких схем лечения на Украине. С 2020 года, так как появилась ковид, Андрей работает пульмонологом в отделении ковид в Винницкой городской больнице и проводит частные амбулаторные респираторные консультации. Андрей, пожалуйста, ваш, вашу презентацию. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Valerio, for, for so a great uh, presentation, and uh, I, I would be very happy uh, to share uh, my presentation with all participants, and because the vast majority of participants selected Russian language as preferred, let me kindly to switch into Russian. Uh, so, um, меня хорошо слышно и видно, чтобы не было никаких заминок. Any technical problems? Do you see the title slide of my presentation and the sound? Is it okay? So let me briefly tell you why new treatment for MDRTB uh is um very uh, topical as never so first of all i would like to uh, say uh the definitions to update the definitions uh, multidrug resistant tuberculosis is a case of tb when uh, mycobacteria is resistant to isoniazid and rifampicin and uh, who has updated uh, this definition and uh, it updated uh, the definition with extensively drug resistant uh, tuberculosis. Uh, it is when um, bacteria is resistant to isoniazid, rifampicin, phenoquilin, uh, lisoniazid, or bidoquilin. Why is it important to understand? Because uh, WHO asks all countries, participants uh, from our region to update uh, the recommendations and uh, they should be able to identify the resistance, um, especially for bedequilin. It is very important to update because uh, uh, we do not use injectable drugs uh, since 2019. They are in priority and uh, we still had um, old definition uh, for such type of TB. Why is it important? Because not in all countries, not in all hospitals of ex-USSR, it is uh, easy to define the resistance to listen uh, to betaquilin. And um, it influences uh, uh, very much uh, the situation, uh, especially for statistical uh, data. Why do we have such a situation when uh, countries of ex-USSR have uh, the incidence of MDR, TB of resistant uh, TB uh, that exceed many times the other countries. Uh, um, maybe the reasons for that, um, um, that uh, if you, we see the cases uh, that were diagnosed in the EU, uh, they are five times less than in Ukraine last year. And the treatment outcomes also leave much to be desired. Uh, XDR-TB, uh, we have a success rate only of 34%. <laughs> and successfully treated case also has um, a special uh, definition of which uh, says that the person has undergone treatment. Uh, we do not have um, um, certain data that, uh, for example, this case um, is treated. And we also have uh, every fifth patient who dies. Um, maybe it's better than in COVID, but still a deaths in the XDR TB is um, uh, very um, bad figures. So according to statistical data, information that uh, the person uh, has been treated, uh, uh, this situation um, does not give uh, much opportunity to identify the resistance. And I would like to start my presentation why it happens, because each case of treatment uh, increases uh, 
uh, the number of resistant forms. Uh, so uh, the answer is the, in the mentality of uh, our countries, uh, because many patients and doctors believe uh, in uh, miracles. Uh, for example, we will have a new drug, uh, betaquilin, for example, and uh, uh, we will be able to treat all forms. Or, for example, if we have new tests uh, available uh, in certain uh, places, we will uh, transport the sputum to those places and uh, everything will work miracles. But miracles do not happen as we believed in communism and a better future. Still, uh, this better future is far away. I have been traveling around uh, the entire Ukraine and I could see that uh, the patients uh, use uh, these wonderful uh, drugs, uh, um, fat badger, um, uh, some other insects, um, immunomodulators for horses. Uh, uh, these are uh, miracle drugs uh, that our patients believe in and um, it's a very bad thing. Uh, I think that our symposium will change this situation. At least it will uh, um, make patients uh, believe less in this uh, miracle. Because uh, if a patient believes uh, in such miracles, um, it's uh, not quite good. Uh, fortunately, we have a new uh, classification of drugs, and you can see it uh, here. And many drugs uh, that have been used uh, before, uh, for example, injectable drugs uh, are not used uh, now, and uh, we can start uh, treatment using pills. Uh, why is it important for me? Uh, because my room where I work, uh, uh, faces uh, the children uh, department and each day at 11 o'clock in the morning uh, when uh, uh, injectable drugs were used and they were obligatory, I could hear uh, the cry of those children uh, because uh, these injections, uh, they are very painful. Um, if uh, adults can, uh, uh, can support this pain children for them it's very difficult um, uh, in recent years i don't hear such cries and why it happens um, the first answer is nosocomial transmission uh, while the patient is waiting for dst uh, results uh, it happens very easy when uh, the patient uh, is admitted uh, to the hospital. In many countries of ex-USSR, uh, in Moldova, in Ukraine, uh, the diagnosis is uh, uh, put based on the text of uh, on the test results. Uh, we do not uh, admit to hospital patients with sensitive uh, TB. But uh, this cartridge does not uh, allow identification uh, uh, susceptibility to many uh, uh, drugs. And so the patients stay in the same ward and uh, uh, they contribute uh, to uh, resistance to other drugs. So, uh, so and also it is vitally important to have information uh, uh, about the resistance to torhinolone, for example. Uh, until we do not have XDR cartridges available, for example, in Ukraine, in our Ukrainian realia and in other countries, uh, uh, we can uh, have only molecular assays um, and they are not available everywhere. But um, we see that uh, almost everywhere we have COVID tests uh, that are performed at the G level. And it is hard to imagine uh, that uh, tests for TB um, could not be done using uh, same technology. If um, we put the patient on a longer regimen, which was uh, uh, in 2019, 
uh, then uh, if we analyze the data from our region, we can say that Ukraine is uh, not Bangladesh at all, and we cannot use uh, this regimen in a country or in the countries where we have quite other structure of resistance. But still, this regimen was uh, applied, and we had uh, 156 patients with uh, rifampicin resistant. Uh, only 35 of them um, could uh, be admitted uh, to uh, shorter types of regimen. You can see the scheme. And in this schema, there were also many issues because canamycin was not recommended, protamine, pyrazinizamide, uh, etambutol, uh, all in all, there are five drugs. Uh, and uh, that means we use less effective drugs and we want uh, this regimen to be shorter than uh, when we use more effective drugs. So. Uh, it was a very big issue from the point of view of ethics, but once we have um, phenotypic uh, tests, uh, many of these patients uh, dropped from the regimen, uh, and only 14, 63% were dropped, and 14% uh, uh, were not uh, able to support uh, to go uh, through this uh, regimen because uh, of side effects and uh, unfortunately uh, we understand uh, that this is a kind of exception and i'm very happy that so uh, we do not use this type of uh, regime uh, regimen and uh, we use short-term regimens that is based on uh, the same drugs uh, that are used for long-term uh, regimens. Another thing I would like to mention is uh, that um, for um, the definition of resistance and uh, for not, uh, not to wait for too much time, uh, we have uh, a molecular test, uh, which takes only one day. We have uh, partners who can provide this uh, service. It takes just one uh, working day. And for the doctor, it is very important not just to uh, understand uh, how to treat uh, the patient, but uh, to what uh, room, to what ward uh, to place these children. If we have uh, a stripe, uh, behind uh, a certain uh, drug. Uh, that means we will not use these drugs uh, at the very beginning. And that means uh, that this patient cannot be treated using short-term uh, regimen, and it cannot uh, be placed in a ward uh, with certain other patients. So uh, this is how it looks uh, in reality. Uh, we have the date when the patient was admitted to the hospital uh, on the third day. And uh, on the 19th uh, day, we uh, get the result that uh, here it is resistant, resistant, and resistant. If we put him in uh, a, a usual uh, ward, and if it was uh, with uh, extended resistance and uh, next to him is a patient who is just uh, rifampicin resistant, uh, uh, they can uh, stay together in the same ward and then uh, they can infect each other because uh, within uh, two weeks, uh, this extended resistance uh, will uh, extend to the other patients. And we will not get to knowing it because the test uh, is done at the beginning uh, when the patient is admitted to hospital. And the second test is done only if we see that there are no results in treatment. Uh, so, um, I mean that uh, we should change uh, the organization uh, of um, case management. We have uh, to understand uh, that when the patient is admitted, 
and uh, we cannot uh, identify the resistance uh, in the first day, then uh, the person should be isolated uh, in a, a special ward uh, for two weeks, for two months, but uh, uh, he should not be placed uh, in a ward with uh, other patients uh, where we do not know the resistance. Uh, it means uh, that we need to change uh, the approach completely, uh, the approach we have now. Uh, but we still have to avoid uh, uh, this uh, drastic situation when uh, the history of TB in uh, the past increases the resistance twice. If uh, the patient uh, has a resistance of a certain type, uh, we uh, пациентами. Может находиться, как в некоторых странах, в одиночной палате. Это достаточно психологически сложно. Андрей, Я противник этого. Андрей, да, конечно. Извините, если вы можете быстренько пройти по остальным слайдам. И с помощью Только времени. У нас есть несколько вариантов лечения. Это короткосрочный, длительный и бипал, где мы применяем бедоквилин, притаманительный. Uh, we have criteria for inclusion of patients uh, in this regimen. And uh, I can also say that uh, shorter regimens are twice um, less expensive than uh, longer uh, regimens. And uh, we also see that uh, such drugs uh, as amicacin uh, has uh, uh, less uh, risk of uh, death and uh, a better uh, indicator of uh, successful treatment because uh, amicacin can be used uh, uh, intravenous. And if we um, have a correct treatment, uh, we can see that um, all the patients uh, uh, have the conversion of sputum within two months. And I'm very glad that in the near future, uh, we can have uh, trials uh, that can uh, identify personalized uh, therapy duration because we have uh, many different types of patients, HIV positive or negative, with different uh, forms of TB. Uh, they have uh, the same treatment. Uh, we need to identify the expression level of uh, nine genes and uh, number of days uh, remaining uh, before the end of treatment. Uh, also, we have new vaccines uh, that have uh, good results uh, if compared with placebo, and uh, they can prevent 50% um, of cases of uh, TB progression, and uh, uh, this is a good result. Even BCG uh, vaccine, it can prevent 30% uh, of uh, multi-drug TB uh, within contact persons. And uh, here you see the opportunities uh, of treatment uh, of contact persons uh, in case of MDR TB. We have many trials and research uh, in these cases. Uh, so we uh, should abandon this practice uh, of uh, uh, waiting uh, for identification whether this is MDR, TB. And I would like to um, conclude uh, with a slide. Uh, we had a national dialogue in Ukraine with many people uh, participating. Uh, there were many uh, non-governmental organizations. 
and uh, we have good results uh, uh, while changing practice. We have special package for family doctors uh, and they can get money for managing TB cases. Uh, thank you for attention. And I would like to say that the longer we wait for the future, the shorter it will be. We have to be active and right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andre. Uh, so the next yes, um, 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 I could mention perhaps. Uh, as a bit of the introduction that I've been uh, director for the Supranatural Reference Laboratory in uh, um, Stockholm, Sweden for many years and much of what I discuss here is based on my experience from supporting different countries and with lab strengthening and introducing new techniques and so on. And thank you very much for inviting me to give this brief presentation of the, what role the TB laboratory can play in modern TB control. I think it's important to lift this question because I think the laboratories can do much more than what is uh, realized really from many sources. We can do much more than we could in 10, 15 years ago. There are new tools, techniques. And I say that money spent in the laboratory side spend, uh, are well spent money because mm -hmm. they save resources down the line in less problematic TB cases, in less resistance and so on. Mm -hmm. But let's come to my presentation, I have the first slide. I think the most important contribution of the laboratory is to offer sensitive, specific and timely diagnosis of TB and of drug resistant TB. This is definitely crucial for the proper control of TB. The timeliness is important because we, if we wait, as the last speaker said, if we wait, wait too long for the future, it will be shorter. We need to, as soon as possible, be able to correct, offer correct treatment for all TB mm -hmm. patients. And cases not detected will not be treated and cured, and thus will continue to transmit the disease. So this is poor from the patient's point of view, and it's poor from the public health point of view. Also, we just uh, please go back. Uh, also, we heard we just heard that there are new drugs and uh, re recommended treatment regimens, and this demands new tests. A new test demands new knowledge. It's unfortunate to introduce new treatments and new drugs in settings where you have no chance whatsoever to detect resistance to these drugs because that might compromise the usefulness in the future of this drug due to an uh, suboptimal combination of drugs used and not protecting them carefully. Next, please. Uh, the aim of this is, of course, to correctly and rapidly separate TB patients that are likely to respond to standard chemotherapy from those not. And, the, and the majority of patients in most countries will respond to standard chemotherapy. We need to detect re resistance to rifampicin and isoniazid if susceptible to both those drugs. I think it's a very high likelihood that it will be fine, no problem with resistance. If resistance to one or both of them, uh, you should be careful and you should be observant for MDR, and MDR-TB needs special attention. Next slide, please. There are different ways to do this, and I already stressed the need that we need timely results to be able to take timely um, decisions. The, cl the classical way to do it is going from an isolate, and then you could do solid media or liquid media taking roughly one month or one week, but to add this time, you should add the time of uh, separate the, the diagnosing the bacteria, to culture the bacteria. So it could be two months or two weeks. In competition to this, we have the new molecular test, which where you have the results within one day, and you go directly from the clinical specimens, typically sputum specimens, to have the results. I think this is what we should aim for, and I would like to see that at least solid-based culture and DST is obsolete today when we have better techniques and a better understanding of the need of rapidity. Next slide, please. 
So rapid detection and resistance offer an early warning system for MDR-TB. And having this warning makes it possible to promptly identify patients with resistance strains, to modify their drug regimens to ensure that we offer something that uh, lead to early non-infectiousness of cure. We can also direct infection control measures in a way. If you remember the last presentation where patients with different patterns of resistance were mixed in one room, having this early information, you can reduce the risk for that situation and direct infection control measures where they are most needed. Also having this rapid detection will re, uh, lead to reducing development and spread of MDR-TB. The spread is perhaps obvious because we will detect and treat the strains correctly. The development depends on suboptimal treatment of, should we say, monoresistant strains or um, polyresistant strains without MDR-TB will lead to MDR-TB and suboptimal treatment of MDR-TB risk to lead to XDR-TB. Next slide, please. And, and click one more. Thank you. Uh, so how well do we do this? The, uh, these are figures from 2015. Some progress has been made since that. Not so much, but some progress has been made. I'm afraid we're coming back to this situation again due to the situation with the pandemic. But anyway, uh, it was said the new patients, the aim for 2015 was 20% for everyone. And you see in the European region, we actually reached that aim. Uh, the world uh, mean figure was 7% and much to be done. In red, you see three, uh, previously treated patients. These are patients that have been through half a year of medications without uh, being cured. Typically uh, due to the effect of drug resistant tuberculosis. And of course, the aim is here that 100% each individual M resistant case should have in vitro DST figures to find out how to optimize treatment and give the correct drug combination. And you see how far from it we is. And still in the world, it's less than 10% of patients offering this. So after basing, should we say, the first uh, treatment on an assumption that the patients would be susceptible. You don't. You have to guess how to how to treat the uh, cases that did not respond. That's not acceptable. We need to upgrade. Could I have my next slide, please? And apart from the rapidity, it's really important to get it right. To me, this is a bit of an over overlooked problem. But let's look into what's happened if you have incorrect results. And now please click, click. If you have false susceptible results, that is uh, isolated or patients come to laboratory and we fail to detect resistance, it leads to a delayed adjustment to the correct therapy. Next. It's prolonged infectiousness and thus further spread of resistant tuberculosis in the society. Next. And for the individual patient, it's worse in the clinical condition. And in worst cases, could lead to the death of the patient. Next. False resistance results, on the other hand, lead to unnecessary chance of an effective standard tubo uh, chemotherapy. And next. Less effective, longer, more costly treatment that has more side effects to the patients. I think, please go back. I think. This situation is not acceptable. We must make sure that we have high quality, reliable DST results, because you see the consequences are really grim, both from a patient's point of view and from the public health point of view. Now, next, please. To, so to meet the demands, we need to increase the quantity of DST. We need to create capacity. And I think the way to do that is to increase the molecular testing, because having biosafety level of the class needed for tuberculosis culture and DST phenotypically is limited in many resource uh, limited settings. And I don't think that's the future solution for this problem. We also need to increase the quality of the DST. We need to have quality management systems, standard operating procedures, internal and external quality control and assurance. These are important, and this is what we should aim for 
to achieve in the laboratory sector regarding DST. Could I have my next? Uh, we have MDR TB and new drugs, and that means that we have to update our diagnostic algorithms to meet the demands for the relevant treatment recommendations. Uh, susceptibility testing of bedaquiline and linozolid should be implemented, should be a priority because they are both in the recommended uh, group of drugs for MDR TB treatment, the first line drugs to be used in MDR TB treatment. And the, Capacity to test those are severely limited in many high burden countries. This we must solve. I would like to see development of molecular tests here. We are not there. We don't have the full understanding of the molecular mechanism. So, so far, the immediate liquid culture system is the recommended tool to do so, but there are a lot of research going on. And as I said, new drugs need new tests, which needs new knowledge. DST methods need to be developed for additional drugs used today and plan to be used in the future. We should not be in a situation when a new drug and a new therapy is implemented years before the susceptibility test of this drug is implemented. And optimally, no single drug should be introduced before it's possible to test resistance to it in the laboratory, at least in the national reference laboratory in the specific country. I'm convinced that molecular testing will become increasingly important over time. And as I already said, more research is needed for the new and repurposed drugs. And we need to know the potentials and the limitations of molecular tests and to understand the consequences to introducing them. And to ensure high quality laboratory service, there is a need for uh, quality control programs that should be implemented for all tests used in the laboratories. And my next slide. And this is to give an example of what the TB laboratory could offer outside the drug resistance area. Uh, coming to molecular typing. And molecular typing of TB strains leads to an increased understanding of the epidemiology and the transmission in a country or in a setting. We can identify risk groups and risk settings where we see outbreaks of TB with identical strains. It is a tool for improved infection control. Infection control is definitely needed. And for example, you see an osocomial spread with one strain in a hospital, then you, need, then you know you need to improve the infection control in that place. It can also improve the characterization of failure cases because there are two alternatives. Either you relapse with the same strain or you are reinfected. And if you're reinfected, there, I mean, the, the way to protect against these two differs. So it's an important knowledge to understand why we see failure cases. And it's also a tool for the quality control of TB laboratories. If we have missed, if we, if we suspect uh, contamination in the TB laboratory, we can use molecular typing to see if there are different or identical strains, which give you a, a piece of the puzzle to understand the problem in the laboratory. And coming to my last two slides, please. This is not the way to do it. We couldn't isolate the TB control system from anything else. We couldn't isolate any geographical areas. We couldn't isolate the problem in any way, but we need to, and next and final slide, we need to collaboration. We need to collaborate. I think a webinar like this stress how much, how much uh, knowledge there is, how much information there is, and that we need to work together. TB and drug resistant TB is a global public health problem, and we must join forces to control it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven. Next speakers. Will be Rosemary. Okay, hello everybody, and thank you, Mr. Hofner, for this nice presentation as well from Jose and Andre. It was perfect to see um, that it's a total different uh, point of view if you go to SME, but it's it's very nice to to see uh, the collaboration and the network growing and have the impact for the public health. So, first slide, please. 
Second slide, please. <laughs> so I would like to introduce the AID group. So we are a small um, enterprise um, uh, company founded in 1989, and we are located in the southwest of Germany. We are still private owned company and focused on developing and manufacturing of IVDs and image analyzing system to evaluate uh, IVDs or other testings. We at the moment, we are a small company, we are around 60 employees and all our products are certified according to the ISO guideline, which is needed um, to get a CE mark in Europe. Next slide, please. Uh, since 2006, we are three companies and I want to go in detail uh, to the company. So we are a marketing and sales department. It's the originally known AID and the face outside. And in the back, we are the advanced imaging devices, develops and produces uh, various imaging devices. Um, and as well, the Gene ID, which is uh, part of the consortium of the Innovation 40B. Um, we, as Gene ID, develop and produce a wide range of IVD, like Lime Probe Essays, Alice Spot Kids, and um, since COVID, uh, QPCR tests, immunoblots, and microarrays. Next slide, please. Um, since 2008, Gene ID is involved in different, um, different projects for TB and other projects, and in this Field, we developed the Lime Probe Essay and the array format for high throughput um, doing the TB resistance and TB diagnostic tool. And as well, uh, we developed a very good cellular assay similar to the Oxford Immunotech testing, uh, doing um, detecting the immune status of uh, infected patients that had TB and more or less the active one. So next slide, please. Uh, this is the two-color early spot, meaning that we, we try to, uh, to monitor the, the infection and check if there is a possibility to distinguish between late and active phase of, um, of the infection. And maybe with this tool, we can see if there is an, um, yes, an impact uh, in stop treatment uh, rather uh, then uh, prolong the treatment for a longer time because of the resistance or something like that. Next slide, please. I won't go really through very short uh, to my presentation, but based on the experience we have with these different networks and based on the experience we have uh, in developing uh, kits and platforms, um, we look for cooperation and we we happy and uh, as Mr. Hoffner told before, it, it's very needed to have a, a network like the Innovation 40B network uh, to have an excellent tool to see the, the new, the new um, development of, of diagnosis tools and kits and as well to see the new um, treatment and to close the gap between um, the laboratory need um, the, the need of good diagnosis tools and to have a good cooperation between all these different fields is necessary to have a good um, network and to collaborate with different, different groups. So thank you, Jose, to invite us to be part of this group. Um, so I want to show only a very short collaboration uh, with, the, uh, with the Institute of Boston. Um, so it's a, it's a collaboration. I want to show how to, to set up a lab and how to start a, a lab in, in an area which is not, not as known, um, yes, like a lab in, in Germany or in Europe. So we try to build up uh, in Namibia a lab um, to, to get a sustainable and sustainable assay to detect um, the TB and to detect the resistance. So we built uh, a lab or we, we set up a lab together with Gunnar Günther um, and um, try to establish uh, a method or two methods, um, NGO, um, new generation sequencing and a certain line probe assay for routine. Um, in order to have have a good good lab practice there, so it's a, 
the idea was to building a research capacity in, in Namibia and to improve the diagnosis and to have a scientific output. Next slide, please. So uh, we start, as you can see in the picture, we start in 2015 with, a, with an empty room. And uh, in June 2016, uh, the employees started as well. And in August 2016, we started directly with the equipment, with the machine. And up to now, the lab is still uh, running uh, and the lab is still working on the conditions, yes, better than we expect. So it's, sorry, go back last. Thank you. So it's, it's a very good opportunity to have a, a collaboration like that to offer, um, to offer the possibility to start with, with a, let's say, diagnosis lab to build up capacity and to have the scientific output as well. So thank you to Gunnar. To, to have this chance to, to start such an approach. And close, finally, let's last slide. I want to stop with uh, my colleagues here at AID. They always be happy to support um, labs, to support customer, to support um, scientific work. Um, it's not a COVID, <laughs> it's before the COVID situation, pandemic situation, so no one has uh, the masks on. Um, so I'm happy to be part of this Innovation for TB project to have, to be involved uh, in a, yes, in a consortium to, to offer our skills and to offer our experience in, in lab and in diagnosis and hopefully we get more input to build up new diagnostic systems for TB. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Uh, now we have coffee break according to our uh, agenda. But we uh, we need to take first the question. Uh, we yeah. are a bit uh, uh, run of time, uh, but still we have a few questions. Uh, so uh, it would be good uh, to address them. Um, I see there is a question uh, to Tina Pratt uh, that was uh, addressed by Olena and uh, kindly passed by me to uh, our speaker. Uh, I know that Christina uh, was uh, um, um, not available for the full uh, event, uh, so we'll keep this uh, question for her. Uh, we'll address her uh, uh, written and the, uh, the answer to questions will be uh, sent to everyone uh, by email together with the materials of the uh, uh, symposium. Um, uh, he, uh, and we, we have, uh, so I see Jose is uh, typing an answer for uh, the uh, question for Christina. Uh, we'll see the answer by the uh, 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 by when we uh, come back from our break. Um, and uh, uh, now I propose to not have a 20 minutes break as uh, you should agree, as we already uh, are uh, ahead uh, of the time. Uh, let's break for 10 minutes and uh, or even less. Everyone is comfortable for five minutes. Uh, and uh, let's come back uh, in uh, Let's come back at, uh, in eight minutes to, to find the golden middle. So we'll be here at uh, uh, 12, 50 uh, minutes uh, here time, uh, 11, 50 Central Europe time, okay? And we promise you that uh, the uh, 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 afternoon part will be, uh, uh, will keep the interest, will keep you interested in, uh, in this, uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Christina. May I ask you one question, Christina? Yes. About showing the slides, um, I, I wonder, uh, have you tried showing both slides, like Russian and Ukrainian? Because you wrote something that for Askar's slides you wanted to do like this, but it didn't. Uh, and we decided see. in the morning uh, or when we all <laughs> got together that it will be only one language. Okay, uh, okay. 
uh, that's that's why uh, so do you want to show both languages uh, or in, in my case i think i would like to show both uh, okay. they would be because i don't think i have um, my uh, um now when i was watching it i, I think like uh, um it's better to have both okay uh, mm -hmm. uh would you like to say uh, uh me to share or uh, would you do by yourself to share the slides Yes. or move the slides I, I well i i cannot share two slides at the same time i thought that you know how to do it okay i i, I don't do. know how yeah <laughs> um, yeah uh, uh that's what uh, uh just to to make sure because uh, uh in the morning we had different preferences so uh, okay yeah, yeah yeah i missed i'm sorry i didn't yeah, no that's, that's mm. okay um so uh, yeah uh let's let's have a, a short break and uh, come back in Six minutes already. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. See you.
Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. And I just to make sure that uh, all the speakers uh, are back. And okay. we can start. We can start. Uh, uh, I think it's always the time. It's 12.51 already. So uh, I think we can start. Uh, next, uh, let me see this is uh, the next. Yes. Uh, thank you. We are uh, about to start. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you first of all, everyone, for joining this nice uh, symposium. I know it's a little bit maybe hard, and there are a lot of very technical information. But I do think, as uh, even coming from a civil society and a community, um, we for being a strong and becoming a strong advocate do really need, need to understand a lot of technical issues because only in this way we can actually actively participate, we can contribute and, and we can advocate for those technologies and products which will bring better and quality of, um, um, care for our, for our TB affected community and TB patients. Uh, I will. Uh, I am saying a great thank you to everyone, and I will try to uh, give my presentation in Russian. So thank you so much for understanding. Добрый день еще раз, уважаемые участники. Очень рада. If you can just use the Russian channel. Good afternoon, dear participants. So oh, is everything okay now? So хорошо слышно? Там, наверное. Все, можно говорить уже, да? Слышно, да, хорошо слышно. I would like to thank you all for participation. I think uh, that you will stay an hour with us. Maybe we will not uh, give you so many uh, technical terms as we are community, TB community, and uh, together with Alona, uh, we will uh, try to explain what is the role of uh, the community in research and development. Uh, many of you know, probably, and uh, we would like to say it once again. Uh, a Romanian doctor uh, who worked with TB uh, said that perhaps none of the diseases uh, have challenged uh, the human mind so much than tuberculosis. And uh, today, uh, during these three hours, we understand uh, how difficult it is, how many uh, small details influence uh, TB treatment. And um, Andre said that uh, we are waiting for miracles in TB, but we should not uh, be waiting for miracles. We should understand what are the technologies, so what research can contribute uh, to improve the situation with TB. And uh, we as a civil society have to search for uh, most convenient, uh, most useful uh, regimens uh, to shorten uh, the period uh, that influences the quality of life of the patient. Uh, we all understand that um, it is very important to have uh, 
community participation in research uh, and development. These are two new terms for our region. And I would like to say why is it important? Uh, why uh, does it influence uh, the effective uh, participation of community? So we have to understand, first of all, what is TB uh, in general? Uh, what do trials uh, represent? And we have to understand the basic scientific language. Uh, because uh, we advocate uh, in TB domain and uh, we should uh, uh, influence uh, trial design and implementation. Uh, the participation of the community is necessary to guarantee that uh, the study which is carried out in our countries and region is acceptable uh, to us, uh, to the community, to those who are uh, the target of these um, trials. And also we have to ensure uh, that results are translated into policy change. Uh, when we have a clinical trial on other development research, uh, this, this is the final uh, result, uh, final uh, aim of this uh, trial. Um, I mean that the results should be translated into policy change at the level of our country. We have to introduce these changes into our protocols and our guidelines and so on. If we speak about uh, the community participation uh, in research, why do we do it? Uh, uh, because we have um, a very specific objective uh, being uh, the representatives of civil society. Uh, we have an objective um, to understand that we are not just uh, the subject or the end user of some uh, medical advances. We should be the partners of all these trials. Uh, we should understand that our participation as uh, civil society in trials, in research and development is the attitude. Uh, it was mentioned by Sven, by Hasse, by Andre, by uh, Dr. Crudo. Everyone says that uh, we have to build partnership relationships. And uh, based on these uh, good partnership relations, we can implement the results of these trials and research uh, successfully at the level of the country. Uh, the um, efficiency of community participation in research and development, uh, it deals uh, with the fact that finally um, community and civil society uh, will become aware and will understand uh, the processes uh, that are going on within uh, research and development. So the slides are not switched. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the next slide. Uh, we have to understand that when we speak about uh, community participation, we have to uh, start with uh, think uh, that there is a special document uh, that was elaborated uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it is about uh, good participatory practice. Uh, Earlier, Christina mentioned another document, uh, good clinical practice. Um, and we say that uh, we as representatives of civil society for us, uh, the um, guideline within this research and development is a good participatory practice in trials. If you have an opportunity, please, um, uh, read this document and uh, you will see that it is it says that all um, the stakeholders should participate in uh, the research including um, civil society community and other partners um, we understand that um, uh, research data are very useful tools for advocacy 
and uh, that means uh, uh, we should participate in parallel. Uh, the representatives of civil society should represent uh, in parallel with uh, scientists because um, further on they will be um, people who will advocate uh, for these research results. If we speak about research and development, we have two types of uh, uh, products produced by it. Uh, these are programmatic uh, or soft uh, uh, tools and uh, hard tools. Uh, by it, we mean uh, drugs uh, and new diagnostic tools. So, if we speak um, about our goals, we understand that it is very difficult to change the policy, but policy changing is uh, aimed at uh, changing the life of uh, patients, the life of people who are in treatment for TB. And uh, it becomes possible only uh, when the results of uh, uh, good, effective uh, research are included in the national uh, documents uh, that serve as a basis for any national uh, treatment uh, protocols or some other documents. Participation in development and research uh, should be done on um, forums and platforms where we can discuss it and this um, uh, platforms should be open for participation. Only when we have open dialogue, uh, we um, can build a good partnership and principles uh, of partnership. We can build partnership with um, researchers, uh, representatives of civil society and patients. So the next slide. If we speak about clinical trials, uh, we understand that this is a method to uh, improve the um, awareness of uh, civil society and community in the field of TB and uh, technologies used in TB and uh, other things. Uh, how does it happen? It happens through certain mechanisms, uh, through information, through communication, it happens while capacity buildings, and uh, I can say that our today's symposium is um, an example of capacity building. Maybe it's a bit difficult uh, at the beginning, but still it's a kind of introductory course uh, uh, to uh, the things um, that uh, science can offer to us. Uh, and I uh, should repeat that only by understanding uh, technical issues so we uh, can participate uh, knowingly in all these uh, researchers. Research and development, uh, these are uh, very important notions and this is a good way to change uh, uh, the attitude of community uh, to research and development in our region. Uh, in um, our region, uh, we have a quite a negative uh, attitude towards research and development. Uh, if we uh, translate literally a clinical trial, it's like a kind of trial, somebody tries something. Uh, it should be um, understood more positive uh, because um, uh, the research community does their best to improve uh, the situation. And this uh, negative attitude um, is generated through years, uh, maybe because um, of the fact that um, there are very few cases when uh, civil society or community participated in uh, clinical trials. For example, in our country, the first clinical trial was uh, stream uh, research in 2016, which involved um, uh, community as well. 
And uh, since then, uh, we have um, this focus on community. <clears throat> and the community has uh, a kind of technical background. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, the representatives of civil society have uh, such uh, stereotypic uh, attitude, but uh, we cannot uh, say that uh, <clears throat> the research community uh, does something uh, bad. But still, sometimes uh, research teams uh, do not understand properly what is the aim of uh, community participation. Um, and we also do not understand it uh, quite clearly. So common um, approach. Uh, Oksana, sorry. Uh, if I can just, uh, uh, Oksana, uh, can I uh, ask uh, to say when uh, I'm using the slide, because I'm, I'm hearing the translation and it's not very easy to, to follow. But let me know if we are on track and the right side and the way. Because it's fast, it's fast. Because I don't have a translation. Yeah, I can start. Yeah, if you can say now. You can say uh, now we have the, okay. uh, the right slide on the screen. Yes, I try to speak uh, faster than uh, they are moved. So we have to understand that um, for uh, civil society organizations and community, we have um, uh, clinical trials and uh, operational trials. Uh, what, a, what is the difference between uh, them? Uh, as you see, clinical trial means that um, they are used uh, uh, to establish uh, the safety and effectiveness of medications, devices, diagnostic products intended for human use. In clinical practice, uh, uh, established treatments are used and clinical research uh, gave us evidence uh, to establish uh, treatment regimens. If we speak about uh, examples, there are a lot of examples of uh, clinical research uh, that are focused on patients. Uh, they concern epidemiology, conduct, uh, and uh, a very important aspect I would like to mention is uh, mentioned uh, in a scientific article uh, that uh, new drugs and regimen approvals uh, should be based primarily on data from randomized clinical trials and uh, supplemental data collected through rigorous pragmatic and operational research. If we speak about uh, operational research, if we speak about operational research, these are uh, such uh, researches that accompany the transfer of knowledge, uh, practices, and technologies for clinical use at the level of the country. It is very important to say that uh, they are characterized uh, by analysis under usual conditions on the clinical, epidemiological, uh, and economic impact uh, uh, that uh, were done during clinical trials. You have examples uh, uh, of operational research. Uh, so this is an uh, assessment of uh, successful implementing of new prevention intervention, uh, then the study of barriers uh, to the application of this knowledge, and also effectiveness of intervention in uh, the real world. Uh, 
So we speak about these interventions in the real world. And uh, the last slide, uh, so, some things uh, I didn't mention, uh, they are uh, gathered here, uh, how the epidemiological situation uh, can influence uh, uh, it was mentioned by Christina, but I should uh, underline that the collection of data is critical to informing uh, guidelines. Uh, no results can be implemented uh, uh, without it. We have to understand that this is um, um, evidence uh, that is crucial. Uh, sometimes the results may differ. Uh, from uh, the ones uh, expected, but also negative results uh, show the direction uh, where uh, should we go? Uh, what uh, other trials uh, are necessary to achieve the results? Uh, and uh, also I would like to say that uh, uh, research and development uh, in TB is underfunded, and uh, this is very bad. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, if they have uh, funds, uh, uh, this research and development is not a uh, priority for research community. We understand uh, uh, that uh, Community participation in research and development is a marathon that needs investments. And maybe the situation will not be changed uh, um, so fast, but we have to start uh, the dialogue. And we have to start discussing the thing that uh, even while designing the trial, uh, the community should participate in it as well. Because uh, uh, because the community should be involved at um, the very beginning to uh, provide good advocacy uh, to uh, advocate uh, changes uh, before we get the results. So communities are available contributors to improve the policies. And uh, uh, this should be understood, and this is true to life. As Christina said in the beginning, if we speak about uh, research and development in COVID, uh, uh, we all see that uh, there is an unprecedented uh, global effort and uh, uh, everyone was involved uh, and uh, we could do a lot of things uh, during this year. And uh, uh, we uh, should uh, uh, push for similar global efforts uh, to respond to TB as well. Uh, we should understand how serious the issues are and uh, we have to advocate uh, uh, this research and we have to advocate for funding of this research uh, for to obtain good results and then change the policies at the level of our country. And the last point, uh, we have to understand that inclusive development pathway, uh, when we speak about clinical trials, so, so I mean including uh, groups uh, uh, of patients uh, like children and other categories. So, so uh, the community can uh, uh, help here. Uh, Hope uh, I did not uh, take a long term. And uh, I would like to thank my colleagues who helped me to elaborate uh, uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, so professors from uh, Brazil, uh, uh, my partners from uh, Global Fund, Thank you very much to all of you, and uh, uh, we will have a round table and I will answer your questions.
Спасибо большое, Оксана. Это очень интересный доклад. Thank you very much, Oksana. A very important uh, presentation, um, a very important message that it is um, um, necessary to provide community engagement in the serious studies. The next speaker is um, Olena. Uh, who is currently in Sweden, but she is from Ukraine originally, so she knows about the realities. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you whether you're going to show my slides in English or in Russian or both. We have slides in English uh, at the moment. Let, let us know, uh, Olena, if you want to, to speak. Uh, let me check. Maybe we have some in Russian. Uh, I would like to have both on the screen. Then it will be easier to follow. If it is possible. So we have them in Russian too. We have them in Russian and in English. Just a minute, please. We are trying. Wow. Да, Олена, есть на объекте заказ. Супер, да, вот это вот отлично, большое. Excellent, thank you very much. So I decided to speak in, in, in Russian because uh, that would be more efficient. Uh, uh, thank you very much that you for letting me talk to you uh, com about community engagement and TB management. I would like to thank Oksana for her presentation because it was very informative and I fully agree with her messages and I will build upon them. Uh, my presentation because Oksana already mentioned about the need to engage the community in uh, scientific research and also in uh, direct TB control at the level of treatment, diagnosis and uh, detection of cases and how community uh, could be engaged and be useful in um, these activities. Next slide, please. On this slide, I just wanted to give some background information and why am I talking about communities? Because I'm not a specialist, a professional in community. I am a microbiologist. I work with bacteria and metabolomics in the laboratory. But I was born in Odessa and I studied at university there, after which I am... Uh, we did my postgraduate degree in Sweden, in Umea University, and I stayed here. So I, um, uh, but, but now we cooperate with my, um, um, on, uh, with my university in Odessa and uh, Odessa uh, TB Hospital as well. I have been working in this area for 10 years and um, I had to start talking about the community because life in Sweden and in uh, Ukraine is different. I love my native city, Odessa, that is considered to be the pearl of the Black Sea, but it is also the city of contrast. People who live in Odessa face difficulties, challenges that my colleague in Sweden have no idea about. And within these 10 years of my activity in the Erasmus programs as well. So I, my role, uh, is um, like a bridge, to be a bridge between the people in Odessa and Umea. And otherwise, my scientific activity doesn't move forward if we do not solve these uh, interaction issues. The next slide. I also, I'm also part of TBNAT. Uh, community where my role is um, uh, advocacy. So this is not uh, the, my uh, initial area of activity, but um, I have learned that communities can and want to engage and contribute, and they can really um, 
make their contribution, their input. And I mean, uh, by community, I mean people uh, who affected by TB, living with HIV, why um, they are eager uh, to get engaged, because this issue affects their life. And of course, they would like to have better health outcomes, better diagnosis. They wouldn't like to spend a long period of their life in treatment. They don't want their children to cry from those infection, in, in, um, injections that they um, get uh, months in a row. And um, the contribution of the communities could be enormous because these people know uh, where the missing cases are. They know how to reach out to risk groups. They know how to improve adherence to treatment. And these people are ready to work with enthusiasm because they know uh, how important it is from their own experience. Next slide, please. How to engage communities in these activities? Because uh, there is uh, quite a um, big discrepancy uh, between communities that are affected by TB and people who work with TB cases, like a doctor like physicians and the academic community. So there is this gap, they do interact, but, um, they, but there are certain challenges. So people want to get engaged, the community is eager to get engaged, but they don't have this opportunity to do it at the scale they would like to. So uh, within my... Uh, um, from my experience, I have an impression that um, I have created an impression that, first of all, if we as, um, uh, as researchers, as uh, um, clinicists, uh, if we want to engage the community, uh, if we want this engagement to be meaningful, we need to base it on, uh, on uh, respect. We need to acknowledge uh, the expertise that these communities could bring in our research. Because most often these people live in difficult conditions and it is very important for them to see that they are looked at not as objects of research, but as uh, equal participants in our common um, uh, fight against TB. TB. We need to provide a platform for these people. We need to train them because um, if you are a researcher, I, for instance, studied for 10 years, five years at university and five years uh, in the postgraduate school. And I study a lot, I read articles, I uh, study literature. And of course, I know more than a person who is an engineer, for instance, and who works in the technical field. They do not know as much about TB as I do. So training, is of a particular importance. Apart from that, support, because some people um, might lose their job and they um, um, they work as volunteers in TB control, uh, but the rest of the time they spend looking for a job uh, to um, uh, support their family. So we cannot regard volunteers as 100% staff. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, what to strive for? I have this idea. Um, in engaging the community, communities, we need to strive for the independence of these communities. Uh, often these communities are not uh, separate people, but these are people already uh, self-organized in some associations or NGOs, but they're still quite um, vulnerable. And it would be uh, it would be good for them to have some financial independence and we have to uh, work for it um, all together. Uh, researchers, clinicists have to think about funding, where these communities get their funding. So if 
it, is, it comes from a big company, then of course, at a certain moment of time, this company will start exercising pressure on these communities to lobby for their interests. But these um, uh, communities have to represent the interests of the members of their community. Uh, cooperation of uh, NGOs with other actors um, uh, has to be, um, shouldn't be based on uh, competition uh, for funding. I hope that NGOs will never uh, have to face uh, this competition with the healthcare. We have to work together. We shouldn't compete with each other and um, trying to get um, as much funding as possible. The more people cooperate, the better are the results. And of course, this there has to be funding. We need to look for funds to make sure that everybody has enough. Next slide, please. Another important thing, communities uh, consist of people. And um, many people, and just like all of us, are not only strong, but also vulnerable. People who have um, been through serious um, uh, trials, uh, challenges in their life, uh, and uh, they might have certain difficulties. Sometimes they burn out. Um, sometimes you can uh, hope for a more active uh, work with these uh, communities. Sometimes uh, you will come across uh, uh, some difficulties and challenges. Uh, and that is um, because many people in such communities uh, work based on their own enthusiasm and that's it. And, we have to take into account this fact and to be understanding. Next slide, please. Uh, here, I would like to give you several examples. Uh, during my uh, collaboration with um, NGOs, uh, community-based organizations, like um, TBP, uh, TB people, uh, 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 we co cooperate with this uh, organization uh, within TBNAT. We had a joint uh, project on uh, TB patient uh, migration. And um, in one meeting, I was particularly impressed by the contribution that communities can make to the uh, joint activities. So, colleagues and Yesenina organized a small uh, symposium for Polish pulmonologists, where um, they showed that migrants in Poland do not have access to TB diagnosis and treatment. And that was uh, an eye opening experience that really opened my eyes. Um, on this importance when the community representatives tell the professionals what is happening in their life and they can that can affect the protocol and the entire situation. Next slide, please. Uh, this example is uh, um, of uh, another two organizations uh, that uh, work with the that are based on the com on TB communities that's the uh, hundred percent life in Cherkasy city Ukraine and uh, the charity fund um, uh, everything is possible in Melitopol. Uh, they also achieve great results uh, due to the fact that they know what to do and how to do so that is important so they know best. Next slide, please. And um, 
everybody knows this uh, organization, TB People Ukraine, very active in Ukraine. They cooperate with TB Rep, and that's uh, I'm very glad uh, they uh, carry out active uh, a campaign to implement uh, the One Impact app for the smartphone that can um, improve the outcome of TB treatment and uh, generally um, TB services. Next slide, please. Um, this is my last slide. I would like to thank you. Uh, this is a um, uh, photo made several days ago by my friends. This is the TB sanatorium, like health TB health resort. Uh, um, not far away from the city where I live. So these facilities were built throughout the country because in Sweden, every fifth TB patient used to die. But now um, the, the incidence rate is very low due to the work of academic um, community uh, researchers and um, all the other stakeholders. Thank you, Thank you very much, much Olena, for such an interesting very presentation. Very Jose to present her uh, colleagues from uh, Barcelona. Jose. Yes, thank you. Um, now is the turn of the team of Barcelona from Service Clinics. Uh, Joan Pau, Millet and uh, Nuria Forcadas that are going to uh, present the, their experience with the project Photo Voice. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, Joan Pao Nuria, if you know that you can select the channel for the English and the Russian for listening, the other, the other explanations, the other, the other presentations. There is a, there is a button in the, in, in the, there is a, a place on the bottom. But well, you, you could introduce, you, you could perform your presentation in English and it will be immediately translated to Russian in the, in the Russian channel. Don't worry. Okay, the floor is yours. Okay, Jose, thank you very much for your kind presentation. Um, it's a great pleasure for us uh, to be part of this Innova for TV consortium. And also thank you very much for this uh, invitation for the NGO and involvement in TV response symposium. Um, we we will talk in English. Our English is not very good, but it's better than our Russian, so uh, we can go ahead with that. With that, and we will talk about one very nice project called Photo Boys that we start here in Barcelona a few years ago. Uh, is the title is the vision of tuberculosis through the pictures of patients. Next, please. What is what it's exactly Photo Boys? Uh, well, Photo Boys is a community-based participatory action. is is a research method, a qualitative research method that uses photos, uh, pictures as a means, trying to yeah, trying to understand and trying to give voice to the experience of study participants. Uh, is it's been used not only for tuberculosis but also for another diseases. And the resulting of these kind of, we can say photo novelas, have been used to support uh, not only advocacy, but also program planning, uh, especially for everybody, but especially for marginalized communities. Next, please. Yeah, we, we we start here this this here I mean in Barcelona this this project it was born in collaboration uh, between the epidemiology service from the Public Health Agency of Barcelona, also with the collaboration of Cerveis Clinics, our TV clinic of reference in here in Catalonia, and together also with the Public Health of Toronto, uh, where the, the the idea was originally. To apply this this uh, photo voice to for TV patient, and they also uh, had a, great, a good, a very big experience with this kind of research method. Next, please. 
So what are the, the objectives of, of, of this project? Uh, the main objective was to provide an opportunity for TV patients in Barcelona to record and share their, their day by day live and experience with tuberculosis through, through photos. Another objective was to help uh, the, the, the health professionals, to help the community and other TB patients or their families to understand and live experience of having TB. Always from the diverse perspectives. And, and the last objective, but maybe it's not the, is, is one of the most important is to decrease the stigma against the in front of the of the disease next please so regarding the methodology uh, it was very very simple this this methodology uh, we, we tried to enroll we enroll in uh, from april to august of 2016 we, we enroll a total of 16 patients here you can see the the inclusion criteria all must be more or equal 18 years old. All patients should be hospitalized in our in our TV, TV clinic. So all were all of them were inpatients under TV treatment. Uh, just a, a, a quick reminder: our TV clinic is specialized not only in MDR TV management, but also in uh, in follow up and assure adherence for the treatment for all kinds of people that have social problems or risk factors for, for non-adherence to the treatment. All patients must uh, uh, sign an informed consent form. Obviously, all of them should be able to use a camera and not need support to do to mental health problems. Next, please. So the site was here in, in Barcelona, this first experience in 2016. Um, we, we compile a varied patient's profile in terms of gender, in terms of age and country of origin. And uh, always uh, we, we perform an, a personal interview previous to the enrollment and uh, patients could uh, sign voluntary with their own name or just to remain anonymous if they prefer. The rules were very simple. Uh, all the photos taken by patients should be unpublished. Obviously, they should be taken by the photos should be taken by the participants and uh, should reflect personal experience. They should to, to try to, to explain with the photo his own experience. A lot of photos were allowed, but uh, we put a maximum. Uh, they should select a maximum from five to ten photos per person. And besides that, uh, besides the picture, the photo, uh, a little uh, text should be also added together with the photo just to, to, to help uh, or to, to complete uh, the message uh, that the patient would, would like to, to give. Next, please. So from the total of 16 people, participating people, uh, 12 were male, four were female, and the range of age was among 18 to 63 uh, years old. The country of origin were, uh, uh, but you, you can see here, Venezuela, Romania, Spain, Angola, Morocco, Cameroon, India, Pakistan, Algeria, Bangladesh, and Bolivia. Next, please. And uh, as a result, um, uh, there was a total of, of 83 photos finally selected. Uh, two of the researchers, two nurses, uh, Nuria, uh, and, and our colleague nurse uh, in, in Toronto uh, analyze the, the pictures, uh, organize putting, putting together uh, in different topics or themes or, or subjects. And uh, the text was translated 
uh, for every photo in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Catalan, just thinking about uh, dissemination activities. So here you can see uh, the different topics that uh, we title uh, uh, after the agrupation of, of photos is um, uh, the topics were uh, the impact of isolation, the coping mechanisms, difficulties, um, a new beginning, uh, resilience, physical experience, positive thoughts, things that I miss, a stop in my life, fight, and stigma. Next, please. And now uh, uh, Nuria is going to, to, to show you the, uh, uh, some of, of, the, of the material, some of the pictures, and read the, the, the text of the patient. Thank you, Jean-Paul. The impact of isolation, the feeling of isolation, the feeling I have when I was isolated with TV is the same feeling as a prisoner in a jail. The only difference is a prisoner has a reason, but a TV patient is a prisoner with no reason. Next, please. Coping mechanisms. Music. Music is a way to keep my mind occupied, so I don't always think about the design. difficulties day by day. The pills will be your daily work. You think every time take the pill, it is one less. But when you think of the number of pills that have entered your body for a year, you feel many things. A new beginning, flower. I'm waiting for the treatment to finish because there are a lot of beautiful things waiting for me. A new beginning. I think when I finish this, I will return to my life, work, start a business, find a nice day. Resilience, jail, TV is like a punishment for me. I have to fight to recover. Positive thoughts, everything will pass. Everything is temporary, including the treatment of TV. It pass and you get through it. Things that I miss. I miss you. The isolation, the risk of infection, and the side effects in terms of your feelings and emotions are elements that can prevent to be intimate with someone. Fight. We need to keep fighting to overcome the disease. Stigma. The non decent life provokes this kind of illness. For example, poverty, no food. Thank you very much, Nuria. Here is a, um, a few pictures and text. We have a lot of more of them. Uh, it's a little representation. Uh, so, Regarding dissemination activities, um, we, we had the opportunity to, to, to present this project in a different Congress. We were in the International TV World Congress in the Union, at the Barcelona World TV Day, and also the, the Nursing International Conference that was uh, held in Barcelona, and the Spanish Thoracic and Neumology Congress in, in Madrid in the 2017. 
we have uh, used social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, to present some of the, of the material. We have using scientific websites also, like Toronto Public Health or the Tuberculosis Investigation Unit of Barcelona uh, website. And we want to perform different uh, kind of educational materials for patients and their families. And uh, we had also the opportunity, and, and we expect to also will have the, the to repeat, to expose uh, this presentation, this sorry, with this project, in different hall exhibitions. We were at the public health agency of Barcelona. We were making an exhibition here at the TV clinic, and um, also we we expect to to continue this kind of hall exhibitions. Um, and uh, also we, we had the opportunity to publish a, a book with the, with the photos. The, the, the title is the patient's perspectives of the li their life experience of TV through pictures. And you can uh, download this book from the uh, um, uh, Tuberculosis Investigation Unit website is uh, uitb.cat. And um, if not, uh, we can also uh, arrange or manage to send you um, one of the other books. Next, please. So regarding the, the success, uh, we think that it's a very effective tool for storytelling, but we, we already know that it goes beyond uh, the storytelling. It's, it's more than that, of course but it creates a community of opportunities, uh, evaluation uh, responses, and, and also uh, photos uh, can be used in multiple, in multiple platforms. So we are discussing and talking about uh, tuberculosis photo voice in Barcelona. And, uh, and we think that it is helping to increase, or well, we would desire that it will help to increase an awareness. Here you have also, and for me, is one of the nice, most, most beautiful pictures. Uh, we are not superheroes, one person said. We need a helping hand when we are sick. Next, please. So this, the, the project uh, uh, doesn't stop here. We, we, we are inside in the Nova for TV. TV project. Uh, we are very happy to be part of that. We have performed some secondments. Uh, Nuria, for example, or uh, Israel were in uh, in uh, in Moldova, in Chisinau, thanks to Dr. Crudo <laughs> and uh, his team and the, the, the pneumologists and infectious disease specialists in the wars. They uh, won more than one year ago because. Uh, uh, was difficult. Uh, they were more than one year ago. But we are still under analysis. We have this material, and uh, we expect to have the, the new photos. And sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, it's fine. It was my last, much <laughs> last slide. No problem. Just to say that, beside to photo voice, uh, we have an, another project called pediatric photo voice here in Barcelona that involves children, and they can make not only pictures but also, uh, not only photos but also pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nuri and Joan. Thank you for uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I want to mention that uh, in reality. Uh, uh, Nuri and uh, Israel was in uh, Kishinev and uh, continue uh, the uh, project and we have a very, very nice picture from our uh, TB patient together with uh, our uh, colleagues from uh, Barcelona. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you and uh, sorry for the, the last interruption. Uh, actually, uh, many of our colleagues from past Center uh, uh, connected uh, with the same account, and uh, probably someone that uh, put his mic uh, or mic on. So uh, that's why yeah, uh, uh, we heard a bit uh, 
uh, of, of discussion in Russia. Uh, now, according to the agenda, we should move uh, to the um, uh, roundtable uh, discussion uh, about the role of the NGOs in uh, uh, research and management. But uh, before this, uh, I would like maybe we take uh, the questions which were not answered, uh, and then we proceed uh, with the round table that will be facilitated by uh, Olena, Andri, and uh, Oksana. So uh, we uh, have here some um, questions from a colleague uh, in, uh, from Kyrgyzstan. If I'm not wrong, uh, uh, regarding uh, the new uh, treatment regimens, and I saw that uh, Andre uh, already uh, answered some of the questions. Uh, but uh, uh, here, actually, we, uh, we have just uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, about some details. So I think uh, we. Uh, we answered all the, the questions, uh, and uh, uh, if not, during the round table, we uh, uh, um, uh, uh, encourage you, uh, all the attendees, to kindly raise the hand uh, and uh, uh, express your opinion in order to be more interested. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, as long as you raise the hand, I will be able to um uh, allow you to speak so you can uh, uh, put your question you can interact and uh, uh, share your experience with uh, each other i will share the uh, uh i will now with uh, my my colleague Oksana uh Olena and Andri, uh, just to uh, continue with the round table and i hope not to uh, bring uh, more than we planned more than 10 minutes uh we planned it at 1.10 uh, uh, Central European time. Uh, let's think about uh, uh, 1.20 for the, uh, the end of this uh, symposium. Uh, I think we, uh, we can do what we should do, wrap up uh, in, the, in the end. Thank you. Olena, Sana, uh, and please. Я, я прошу прощения, я не очень хорошо слышала, Кристина. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, hear quite well, Кристина. Um, uh, мы, мы должны начать? Uh, uh, shall we start? Olena, which channel did you choose? Please, please make sure you are on the right channel. Okay, may may. May fill, fill in this, this gap, so we just need to start this uh, uh, discussion. And I, I would like to to thank uh, all uh, previous speakers because it's really important to make the right diagnosis, to have the right treatment, and to involve uh, our non-governmental organization from the beginning of, of the development of idea and then proceeding with any clinical trials as well as well as implementation of operational research. And uh, from my side as clinician, uh, I, I would like also to support what uh, our last speakers uh, uh, said. Uh, the, the, the projects like a photo voice is a very easy way to demonstrate the real life uh, of our patients and share the experience, some difficulties and uh, mistrusting uh, or some um, uh, expectations from the treatment period or being isolated or having some some troubles and also would like to to share my my great respect for the service clinic where i also spent a few weeks uh, many many years ago yeah thank you so much andre just to just to clarify uh, um, the language uh, what we're going to use during our small discussion uh, english because it's, it's fine for me Christina, will we speak English or we should switch to Russian? It's up to you. 
but it's fine for me. So it's not. I'm just wondering uh, of, of the audience what 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 is the preferred language. Uh, in the meantime, could could you please share the the slide we have prepared yesterday with the colleagues of Olena and Andri? We prepared a kind of free focus questions. We want to to. Uh, uh, every one of you who is uh, joining us today to be thinking. Uh, we had a little bit de de deviated from the, the topic as, as of uh, uh, research priorities and uh, TB management priorities and tried to include as well the question related to the role of uh, um, communities and engaging communities in research and development. Maybe we should first start with the challenges uh, first of the practices, if there is any willing a volunteer to speak, if uh, they had any chance previously to, to be engaged in a clinical research or an operational research as uh, representing civil society in your own countries. Are there any volunteers? And as well, before having the people connected, we have the second uh, Second question related to the challenges. What will be the challenges to engaging communities in research and development? And the last one will be what you imagine would be the best collaborative activities to, to be taken, first of all, to ensure engagement of civil society. Uh, I think if we uh, will identify at least three challenges, three practices and three activities, uh, we can put them on a pa paper and uh, write a kind of uh, uh, position paper out of this uh, today's discussion of the civil society. I will invite uh, people to join and of course my colleagues can complete me in this. Anyone willing? Is anyone raising their hand, Christina? Uh, no, uh, but actually, you can take uh, some of the questions. Uh, have, uh, As I see, Valerio would like to, to comment. Yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. Could, could someone read the question? Because I can't open. The, I tried to. Ah, I have a question from uh, Nona Turusbekova relating to the document uh, which I referred during the presentation. Yes, I did mend the um, good participatory practice. So that's the document I spoke about uh, during my presentation. And uh, I, I'm afraid that if I will uh, open the box, I will... Uh... Uh, Oksana, uh, there uh, is uh, uh, a question from Nina Babikova uh, to you. Uh, uh, regarding which first step um, uh, including a mandatory of including community in research of development protocol the study protocol. Christina, unfortunately, uh, you have very very voice, but I quality of sound and we can't recognize your voice. I, I have managed, I have uh, opened actually the box and I can see in the chat the questions regarding what will be the first. На русском мне лучше отвечать, как удобнее, потому что вопрос на русском, да? The question is in Russian, should I answer in Russian? Хорошо, давайте, вот вопрос здесь. So the question is... Вопрос, каков должен быть на первый первый шаг включения включения пункта обязательного участия? Я думаю, что я думаю, что первым шагом для участия гражданского общества in the research uh, and development should be uh, transparency strengthening. Uh, the research should be transparent for civil society. Uh, we understand quite well that um, it is uh, very difficult uh, to involve uh, the community at the stage of um, 
uh, initial uh, design of the research because uh, there are donors and uh, some other factors that create barriers. But uh, once we know that the country or institution uh, will uh, carry out uh, a kind of research, a clinical trial or operational research, uh, we should uh, uh, have an open uh, webinar when, uh, вот этой команды исследователей uh, доводят до team. всех информации. Uh, make everyone aware of the research. Uh -huh. Что-то у нас завис интернет. Пока у Оксаны нет возможности продолжить, я бы хотел ответить While на вопрос. Пока Оксана не имеет возможности продолжить, я бы хотел ответить на вопрос. Была хорошая вопрос от участников, что делать с ситуацией, когда пациенты часто слышат миф, что ТБ инхеритит, и это транспортировано от генерации к генерации. Как мы можем бороться с этим мифом? Indeed, um, a number of studies have appeared recently that study the genetic predisposition to um, the mycobacteria. And uh, so um, that is a misinterpretation of scientific results, sometimes misinterpreting the clinical results. Patients uh, tend to believe the fake uh, news that the, the TB uh, could be transmitted uh, from parents to children. And um, maybe 30 or 50 uh, cases that there have been in the entire world of uh, in uh, um, when a child could be infected by their mother, uh, but uh, at birth, but not not inherited. If it happens, then that means that children get infected from their ill parents. And I would like to uh, sustain what uh, Andre is saying. This is not about fake, this is about anachronism, because uh, uh, before they um, uh, before they found this um, uh, bacteria, they thought that TB was inherited. Because, but because people who used to live in the same household uh, uh, were ill, that is why they considered like that. But now we know that is not it is not a fact. And if the family members now uh, fell ill, this means that there has been transmission. And this is what we have to explain to people. This is a chronic disease. At a certain point of time, somebody was in contact um, in contact and that is why they got infected and the same situation was with helicobacter when they thought that also um, used to be an, um, genetically transmitted in infection or disease but it is very good that you have such uh, questions and um, um, they are saying that starting with the 10th of May in uh, their country, uh, they will uh, introduce the new drug, but the question was about the efficiency of that drug. So in order to learn about the efficiency of new drugs, we need to conduct research. And if a new drug is introduced in a country, then uh, um, Maybe the uh, patients that are going to take these drugs should be engaged, involved in um, uh, in, the, in studies uh, to um, to collect evidence in support of the effect of those drugs. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to have new uh, drugs and new uh, treatment regimens, and we'll keep complaining that everything is bad. Th this is true, and I would like to continue Oksana's thought. Maybe somebody would like to say something um, about the examples of um, engagement, or uh, something happened. Um, 
um, I would like to add to what Andri has said um, about Ritamanid and the questions. We know that one drug is not sufficient uh, in TB treatment. We know that it has to be a mix, a combination of drugs. And um, uh, we need to understand uh, the seriousness of the issue. And then the, when the civil society asks questions, we need to understand and make them, un them understand, explain them that we need um, efficient um, treatment regimens, uh, schemes, because one drug doesn't save. Unfortunately, TB um, requires uh, combined uh, treatment by several uh, drugs. So we need to understand, and this underlines the importance of this operational uh, research and clinical studies that help us collect the evidence base in uh, order to, um, to improve the situation. Regarding practice, uh, talking about Moldova starting with the 2016, uh, thanks to the two clinical studies, um, uh, that we conducted on the short uh, treatment uh, regimen with the uh, three drugs, of which one is uh, Tomanid. I think that um, a community engagement in the first place um, is a, in this context is about building their capacity. The Olena has also mentioned that it is important to realize that we know nothing, so we shouldn't stop here. And we shouldn't stop and say that we have learned everything and we do not need any additional knowledge. Luckily, in the last years, uh, um, there has been a revolution in TB. Um, we, one can say, because uh, what used to be efficient and recommended yesterday is no more uh, is no more relevant, and the entire understanding is changing the approach. So we really need to be uh, uh, in trend, and we need to understand that we as community have to uh, have to focus on training. Um, in, in order to make sure that we do not lobby certain interests. Again, there are certain risks. Uh, we shouldn't lobby uh, certain interests, but we should understand that we represent the interests of the communities in our country. So first of all, um, that is about building capacity and knowledge in order to make sure that we engage correctly. That is a marathon, as I have mentioned, but we have to uh, launch it, we have to start it. But uh, without knowledge, we will not be able to respond efficiently as a community. So that is an imperative need. So if we need to engage efficiently, we need to realize that uh, uh, we have to be aware of the basic terms of the basic um, uh, knowledge and will always um, lose in front of um, research and science uh, community because if we do not operate uh, with the same terminology. Well, you will not lose. I just wanted to underline that all of us have a studies in uh, our particular field. Of course, the TB professionals have the studies, the specialist studies, but activists might have uh, different studies not related to TB. I respect uh, the um, uh, area uh, of activity of all the activists, but there are, because there is specialized knowledge that cannot begin within a year. And, uh, but what we should aim towards, we should speak the same language. So you don't need to go on uh, microbiology courses, but it would be very good to identify that common language we need to meet uh, more often and um, find a compromise. By, by education, actually, I also refer to certain competences and certain skills, because of course, uh, what we study today might not be relevant in 10 years. There is a question uh, 
Sorry, go ahead. In the, in the chat, a comment from Victoria, who is writing that they use the capacity of their partner, um, a municipal TB service, to train outreach workers um, um, from uh, people living with HIV in order to raise awareness of H, uh, people living with HIV about TB. Can we ask Victoria to give us more details about that? Well, uh, first of all, while Victoria is going to speak, I would like to say that COVID uh, has uh, provided us with this positive experience because in many countries, they introduce these online trainings and in our country as well. Uh, so the events that are uh, organized for clinicists online are also open to NGOs. So the access is quite free. Uh, you, you know, to engage the civil society, to make them, the community understand the uh, specifics. So unfortunately, well, we are sorry about the COVID pandemic, but it also opened up some new doors uh, for us in this sense. So when they organize webinars um, uh, with exchange of experience, then um, to the extent possible, it is necessary to participate uh, in order to gain new knowledge to interact that is required for community development because at a certain point uh, in time the uh, communities uh, and the NGOs from service providers might become something more and start participating in the other processes both internally and um, uh, on the regional level. So Victoria has raised her hand. You can speak. Uh, uh, dear colleagues, I'm not sure whether you can hear me all right. Thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this event. And uh, answering the question, I would like to say that um, uh, a sub-project uh, by Pass Center under the TB Rep uh, program um, uh, allowed us the uh, community-based uh, organization of people living with HIV to uh, become friends with the TB service and to establish partnership. We uh, started uh, from um, uh, when uh, jointly with the TB uh, physicians uh, developed uh, a and conducted a series of webinars for people, for our beneficiaries, and for, uh, for our outreach workers um, from among the people that living with HIV on TB issues. And um, that has been extremely useful and efficient. Everything that uh, we have heard today is also very interesting, um, uh, important and useful, and we'll use this information in our activities as well to inform our uh, staff, to inform our, uh, our partners. And we are always looking for uh, possible partnerships. And... Uh, so we are always uh, ready to participate in different initiatives. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, the fact that you publish this information and that you feel more empowered and more knowledgeable, that is very good. Thank you very much for your comment. Thank you very much, Victoria. I would like also to give a, a positive example in Odessa, how civil society cooperates with the hospital they uh, merged um, uh, TB uh, hospital uh, with another facility. And of course, when a TB patient has to uh, do uh, computer tomography, the hospital cannot cover the cost. But uh, based on a contract uh, often uh, signed by, with NGOs, that problem is being solved uh, during a day. Otherwise, the patient... Um, the patient has to find 100 USD in order to have that computer tomography uh, run. Uh, 
so this is an example how the specific problem of a patient can be solved by engaging uh, the community. And also, uh, Olena uh, presented a very important tool uh, that allows, uh, that helps uh, patients uh, and uh, other stakeholders to communicate, like that one uh, in uh, app, that, that application for smartphone, for instance. Like, um, uh, if patients have any problems with the documents, for instance, or they need uh, someone to take care of their household while uh, uh, the patient is on treatment. Unfortunately, these issues cannot be solved by a hospital, but NGOs do, community-based organizations do. And I uh, saw how this One Impact app works and we um, told our patients about it. And I'm very happy that uh, thanks to TBR app, we have this opportunity. So you do not have to call anywhere or write someone. That is done on the spot in the hospital that is solved and everything is settled. Indeed, the One Impact app is a very good example. It has been systematically implemented in several countries as far as I know. And it is very useful indeed because it uh, permits to collect a large uh, volume of data. And I um, know that uh, Ukrainian colleagues uh, collected uh, hundreds of um, feedbacks uh, from this application. So um, statistics, these statistics, this collected statistics uh, show, um, inform the decisions and um, uh, develop uh, measures or actions. Uh, colleagues from Militopol, which is um, a city in uh, Zaporozhye region in Ukraine, uh, they, um, the charity fund uh, there cooperates with the TB hospital, with local TB hospital. They have this discussion about TB beds. Uh, well, it is another topic. It is a topic for another discussion, how many beds uh, a hospital, TB hospital needs in Militopol. But uh, we have to acknowledge that without the engagement of civil society, that hospital would be um, closed uh, a couple of years ago. And then in the pandemic, this hospital wouldn't have the possibility to receive COVID patients uh, because uh, people come to the hospital in a really um, a serious condition and they, they need uh, in, uh, immediate attendance. They require emergency care. So thanks to NGOs, that hospital was preserved and with um, about 70 uh, staff members, uh, with 70 beds, around 70 beds. So people have this possibility to be treated in their home city without having to be moved somewhere else. So now in the pandemic, in the midst of the pandemic, when all the resources are uh, prioritized for uh, COVID, um, and uh, the national service uh, doesn't have budget. The municipal, uh, the city hall has allocated some budget to remunerate, to pay uh, the hospital staff for their work. And NGOs also uh, help uh, the hospital, including in some um, non-clinical cases. This is a very good example. And also uh, following um, on the presentation of Christina, uh, I can give you the example of our hospital. We have more COVID than TB patients at the moment, but sooner or later, TB, um, COVID will end, but we'll still have that um, um, oxygen uh, stations and uh, our patients on palliative care will have access to oxygen. They used to dream about it and now they're going to have this opportunity. So if they require oxygen and in palliative uh, cases, uh, that is often one of the main um, forms of treatment. 
uh, they will, these patients will have this access. And actually, we do not know what is going to happen after COVID because just like um, Christina mentioned, COVID is going to leave a lot of people behind with lung pathologists and uh, who knows what um, long-term effects we're going to uh, face or observe um, in TB co-infection. So I think uh, your oxygen will be of great use to you. Concluding remarks. So we have to conclude now. Thank you very much. We will conclude this round of discussions. Thank you very much. If you have any additional um, um, uh, any additional comments or questions, maybe this is to the uh, organizers of today's symposium. We need to follow up on this. Uh, maybe we could organize separate sessions on uh, different aspects because today we, we have covered everything. And I'm sure that each of today's presentations is worth a separate day of or separate webinar. And uh, in order to present and to assimilate, to digest all the information presented by all the speakers. Thank you very much to all. Thank you very much, Oksana, Andy, and Olena. Okay. Uh, we need to our uh, symposium. Um, I want to mention that it's very pleasant to see what uh, a lot of uh, participants uh, was uh, uh, present during our uh, symposium. Uh, I hope uh, all information that we uh, present will be helpful for uh, future our collaboration of uh, uh, society and of uh, NGO. And uh, uh, Okay, this is not uh, what mentioned Oksana, maybe not uh, last our uh, symposium. Uh, we, uh, we organized before and we organize in future. Uh, and uh, of course, only together we can uh, uh, fight TB because uh, alone it's not possible to, to have uh, uh, good success. Uh, for not forget, I want to uh, uh, tell the thanks to Center Pass and Tibere project, but in special thanks uh, Christina, who was very, very nice uh, organize, organizing this uh, uh, symposium. Also, uh, of course, uh, uh, Tibere uh, was uh, financing, and uh, uh, we want to thanks also Innova project and all uh, speakers who was present for a very nice uh, uh, presentation. And uh, of course, we hope that we have possibility to continue our uh, collaboration because uh, um, uh, yes, uh, sometimes uh, research go in, in, uh, in, in top, but uh, uh, not every, everybody know about our uh, new diagnostic, new uh, uh, drugs, new uh, scheme of uh, treatment, and uh, of course it's, it's necessary to uh, everybody to be in time of uh, of uh, all uh, results of uh, results of research. Uh, I hope our colleagues uh, Sven and uh, Jose also tell about. Yep. Yeah. I can say a few words before we round up this session. I'm actually going to tell you a short story from a country I visited where I suggested that it would increase the susceptibility to testing to identify additional patients with drug-resistant tuberculosis. And they told me, no, we are not interested. We don't have enough drug, we don't have the capacity. It would be useless for us to identify additional individuals from multi drug resistant. I told them, I totally disagree. I think knowing this is important to make sure that you can ensure resources needed to do a good work. And my message here today would be, don't be blinded for the problem because you don't see the solutions today. Understanding the problem is a need to actually con uh, construct tomorrow's solutions. 
So I think it's important to not to be blinded for the prob uh, for the problems in the in the way they actually wanted it to be. So I think all of us this has a chance to influence the political commitment or the ensuring relevant granting for struggling and fighting tuberculosis should try to do so because we heard to derby there are many activities there are many ideas there are many new techniques coming up but we need resources to do it and i think today it's much more politically tempting for decisions makers to put money into coronavirus than into tb at least in a low tb burden country like sweden no one would be interested to put money into tb so i think we have a role to not neglect not forget continue to fight against tb and join forces and collaborate finally thank you thank all of you that contributed to the organization of this webinar i think you did a very quick and efficient and good work thank you for all participants to being with us here today thank you all thank you very much sven and valerio for this uh, this uh, very important concluding marks uh, I, I want to also say thank you to all the participants, uh, all the speakers, and obviously the placenta for the organization. It has been uh, incredible, the uh, efficiency. I want to say that uh, the symposium has uh, uh, high quality, uh, very good speakers. And in my view, this is the way. We, we should to work together. We should to involve uh, researchers and physicians, companies, and also communities in the in the in the fight against against TB. Uh, for sure, literacy of the past of the patients is key because it's important that they understand the disease and they understand the research is key because the research is key for advancing in the in the TB fight and for ending the TB in some moment. Then I have to. I, I have the dream that in some moment the, the patients will be extremely happy to participate in research. And they put uh, pictures in the social networks explaining that they have lucky to participate in a clinical trial because this is, this is, this is the way. Um, of course, the communities should play a, a, a key role in the implement, implementation of the new technologies and the implementation of policies. And we have to work together to press politicians, to press people that have to take in decisions for investing money, money and investing uh, politicals that protect patients during the disease and after the disease, because uh, the disease, uh, sometimes we are talking about the infection, but the, the disease has a lot of uh, sides, uh, including social diseases and, and uh, psychological disorders that should be, um, should be treated uh, together. Then from my side, it did, that's all. Uh, as a coordinator of Innova for TV, I have to say thank you again to the PASS Center and all the NGOs involved in the organization and that has participated. Uh, I think it will deserve a second edition, maybe next year. And maybe we can go further and try to involve also politicians in the discussion. From the different countries, why not? And 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 go further in this in this uh, implementation of new technologies, new drugs, and improve the health of the population in in, in uh, over the world, but especially in the eastern and central Asian countries where the TV is is worst. Then thank you to all of you, and and see you soon. I hope. Best regards. Thank you, thank you, everyone. If you hear me and. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you hear me. I just yeah. uh, wanted to say uh, thank you for the great speakers that uh, uh, kept all our uh, uh, auditory engaged uh, for four hours. Uh, it's a, a big achievement to keep almost one hundred people uh, for four hours and we had uh, uh, almost all the participants that were uh, 130 uh, attended uh, more than three hours so we <laughs> it's it's a great achievement and it's only due to your great pro, uh, uh, experience uh, that you shared here and i'm sure maybe a next edition should not be postponed for the next year as we had 
250 registration and some of the people um, uh, had some uh, troubles in the morning to connect, uh, we probably can have a second edition even earlier <laughs> for those who couldn't connect today. But anyway, uh, the re uh, recording will be available and to all the registered participants together with the materials and with the certificates of attendance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you, Christina. And Thank all. you. Nice. Thanks for nice together. organizing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, Rosemary. -bye.